welcome to My Baseball History. I'm your host, Dan Wallach. My Baseball History is a long-form interview podcast where each episode I'll talk to someone new who has some sort of association to the game of baseball. No matter who I talk to, we'll talk about how they fell in love with baseball, how their career started, and how they got to be where they are today. On today's episode, I spoke with photography connoisseur and Charles Conlon collector, Paul Rieferson. You may not know the name Charles Conlon, but I guarantee you know his work. Conlon was one of the first great baseball photographers, starting about 1904 and working until 1942, three years before he passed away at the age of 76. Charles Martin Conlon was born on November 28, 1868 in Albany, New York. He grew up in the neighboring city of Troy, starting his career working as a proofreader for New York City newspapers in the early 1900s. He took up landscape photography as a hobby before getting a foot in the door in the sports world. Conlon used a Graflex camera and glass plate negatives before switching to film later in his career. While Paul and I use some industry terminology in this interview, I promise you don't need to be as knowledgeable about photography as Paul is to understand or enjoy the conversation. We spend the first part of our conversation simply defining some terms and concepts and explaining early photography processes so everyone can be on the same page for the duration of the episode. All in all, Charles Conlon created somewhere in the neighborhood of 40,000 images throughout his career. Thousands of those photos were portraits of Major League Baseball players from the first half of the 20th century. Many of his images, especially those of baseball's early stars, are instantly recognizable, even to casual fans. They have frequently been reprinted over the years, included in numerous books, on thousands of trading cards, and even used in documentaries. Conlon was taking these photos before moving pictures were widely available, so his photos were often the only way the general public was going to be able to put a face with the names that they were reading about in newspapers or in the annual Spalding Baseball Guide. His photos are what come to mind for most fans when they hear the names Christy Mathewson, Big Ed Walsh, and Mordecai Three Finger Brown, even if the fan doesn't know who the photographer behind those images was. Like I said earlier, you might not know his name, but I promise you, you know his work. The Graflex camera allowed Conlon and his contemporaries to shoot on location instead of being confined to a studio. However, they were all working at a time before telephoto lenses allowed photographers to get close-up shots without being super close to the action. This meant that photographers were actually positioned on the field, squarely in harm's way should an errant throw or foul ball catch them without time to instinctively react and get out of the way. Conlon's most famous photo is one that came to be because of his instincts and his positioning on the field, and it's one that Paul and I discuss in this interview. The photo was taken July 23, 1910 at Hilltop Park in New York during a game between the Yankees and Tigers. Conlon captured what is considered by many to be the first great action sports photo in history when he snapped a shot of Ty Cobb sliding into third base, taking out Yankees third baseman Jimmy Austin in the process. The photo was groundbreaking and is the gold standard for baseball photography even to this day. It is perhaps the most recognizable image in the history of the game, taken nearly 115 years ago by a hobby landscape photographer who went on to change the way people view sports, literally. It's not just that Conlon shot the defining image of this guy or that guy, though he certainly has done that for a number of players. It's that his work continues to influence other photographers in modern times. Our guest today, Paul Rieferson, fell in love with Conlon's work the first time he laid eyes on one of his photos. Paul is a collector who tells American stories through his photography collection. Baseball images have been a principal focus, particularly the work of Charles M. Conlon, and he has been a featured speaker about Conlon, about photography, and about collecting at several museums. He spent decades amassing the most complete Conlon collection ever privately assembled. In connection with his gift of almost 500 Conlon photographs to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, Paul is collaborating on the first ever solo exhibition of Charles Conlon's vintage prints. Other photographs and objects from his collection have been exhibited in numerous museums, including the Brooklyn Museum, the Bronx Museum of the Arts, and the American Museum of Folk Art. While Paul and I spend significant time discussing Charles Conlon and other baseball photographers, The large point is that this discussion was about Paul's desire to learn how to see photographically. Charles Conlon was his doorway in, and for many people, Conlon is an accessible point of entry too, but there is no right doorway. In this episode, we cover lots of ground. Paul tells us why he thinks the type system currently being used to date and authenticate photos is fraught with issues and should be abandoned. We find out the difference between an individual photographer and a photography news service, such as those operated by Paul Thompson or George Grantham Bain. We learn the names of some of the founding fathers of baseball photography, like Carl J. Horner, Francis P. Burke, George Burke, and George Brace. And we hear why Charles Conlon's photography has stood the test of time, continuing to inspire viewers a century later. With all of that information and much, much more coming at you, 
it may be helpful to follow along with the episode's liner notes on our podcast website. You'll still be able to enjoy the interview without the extra help, but sometimes when I'm listening to things like this, I like to really go in depth, so I've provided some photos and links to give you a better understanding of the things Paul and I are discussing. Those liner notes can be found on the My Baseball History website, which is online at www.shoelesspodcast.com. If you want to follow along, head to the website where you'll see the Paul Rieferson episode listed first on the main page under Latest Episodes. Click on that and you'll be ready to follow along. There's an embedded media player right on the page, so you don't need to have multiple windows open while you listen or fumble around with multiple devices. If you want to catch up on any of our previous episodes, you can click on the tabs at the top of the website to go back through past episodes from any of the three seasons to date and see a full list of everything we have to offer so far. Everything in the liner notes goes in chronological order of how we talked about them in the interview, so you should easily be able to keep your place as you listen. After the interview, we'll do a recap of what you just heard, adding some extra insight and hopefully answering any questions that may have come up as you listen, so stick around until the end of the episode for that. But now, here's my interview with photography connoisseur and Charles Conlon collector, Paul Rieferson. Tell me a little bit about where you grew up. I grew up in a development, kind of like a Levittown, Mm -hmm. and there were models of homes. They were called Kilmer, Bryant, Longfellow, Sandberg. I lived in an Emerson, and no one knew who they were. How did you then? If nobody else did, that means that they weren't being taught that. So how how did you go out of your way to learn? I mean, I I looked it up, but I just knew that there was something larger than I was getting in central New Jersey, Mm -hmm. and it really drove me to college at the University of Virginia. When you were growing up, were you into art and history first and then baseball? Or were you into baseball first uh, that, and then... That's a good question. I was into history from the very beginning, into mm-hmm. ancient coins and things like that. But I went to a bookmobile at school, and I bought a book called The Glory Years of Baseball. It was like a dime book. Mm-hmm. And I just fell in love with it. And for me, going to the bookmobile was like heaven. It was like my favorite day of the year. And I probably read that book, The Glory Years of Baseball, over a hundred times to the point where I'd memorized the whole history of baseball from 1869 to the 1950s. What were some of the eras that really jumped out at you? I loved reading about the Red Stockings. I loved reading about the 1927 Yankees. Anytime there was a great story around the characters and people like Shoeless Joe Jackson or anyone like that, Mm -hmm. it was like an American mythology. And I wanted to know all the myths. Who was your team growing up? Like, who did you root for in the current day while you were a kid? Earlier on, it was the Mets until 1973 when they broke my heart, Mm -hmm. and then I became a Yankee fan. Interesting. And who was your favorite player then growing up? I love Bucky Dent. I love Greg Nettles. Those are the two that really stand out for me. I like Thurman Munson. I was very sad when he passed away. I like Billy Martin, the way he managed the Yankees. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's so many. What is your earliest baseball memory? Uh, Probably striking out in Little League multiple times. (laughs) (laughs) When you started getting into the baseball history side of things, what drew you to learning about why those things happened? Not just how they happened and who the characters were and the players, but like you've taken it to a different level where you have done research and become the scholar of the game. Like, how did you go down that path? So, when I was in fifth grade, someone had a 1967 Bob Euchre card, which was a very old card back then. And this was probably in like 1974 or something. So, I'd never seen a 1967 card and I'd never heard of Bob Euchre. And I thought that was great. And then someone told me that there was a Babe Ruth card you could get at the English Town Flea Market in New Jersey. And the idea that you could own a Babe Ruth card just absolutely blew my mind. Mm -hmm. So I begged my father to take me. We went down to the flea market and walked around until we found a table with old baseball cards. And they didn't have Babe Ruth, but they had Burke Ross cards from 1951, 52. And my father's favorite was Richie Ashburn. And I really wanted to collect everyone that my father liked when he was a kid. And that's what really got me started learning the real history of the game in granular detail. And would he teach you about that kind of stuff? Or was it kind of just... You couldn't stop him from talking about it. Yeah. He loves talking, even to this day, loves talking about Richie Ashburn and what he meant to him as a kid. That's awesome. You mentioned going to Virginia. What did you study there while you were there? And when you enrolled, what did you think? When I graduate, this is what I'm going to do. At first, I was pre-med, which is what my mother had me aimed at. And I just wasn't a good pre-med student. 
but I loved reading about international relations and diplomacy and was convinced that I was going to work at the State Department or possibly the CIA. I had a long interview with the CIA. I was invited back for several rounds of the State Department. And then I had a bunch of friends who were getting very lucrative offers on Wall Street. And it just seemed so attractive to me. I, mean, I was just seduced by the money, mm -hmm. which was a terrible thing to be seduced by. But there it was, and I made that choice, and that was it. But you went to Harvard Business School, right? You got an Correct. MBA. What was something that you learned there that you still use to this day, whether it was in a classroom or, or not? Oh, boy. It's interesting. There's a, um, there's a book called The Wise Men by Walter Isaacson, and I read that in the late 80s, probably around 1987, 88. And there was a person in the biography named John McCloy whose mother had told him, run with the swift. And she had introduced him to the Rockefeller family, and he became a tutor to the Rockefeller family, and ultimately a financial advisor and legal advisor to the Rockefeller family, and like their true confidant. And at Harvard Business School, I really learned the benefits of running with the Swift, the most impressive, kind group of people I've ever been around. In any aspect of my life, I try to just to recreate that environment. Interesting. Bridging the gap between sports and art is such an appealing thing. Like, while photography and baseball has been seen as incredibly important for the past century, and there are dozens, if not hundreds, of iconic images that true baseball fans have been able to instantly recognize for generations, it seems like photography in general is starting to become appreciated as much more of an art form in the past couple decades. Obviously, photography is nothing new, but it seems like museums are taking it more seriously, and the public mm -hmm. is catching up to artists like Ansel Adams, Paul Strand, Dorothea Lange, people like that. With that attention and recognition comes greater monetary value, and the average person is much more familiar with a lot of terms that weren't as commonplace 20 years ago. So before we get into your collection and talking about a few specific mm -hmm. photographers, let's make sure everybody's kind of up to speed on some photography terminology. So what is a negative? Think of a negative as a musical score. Just as a composer writes a musical score, that score can then be played and interpreted by the orchestra and the conductor in any number of ways. A negative is very much like that in that it can be manipulated in a dark room. These days it can be manipulated digitally in various software programs. It's an image that has the potential to be something other than exactly what it is on the substrate on which it exists. Is there such thing as a positive? Well, the positive is the print. But if you look at someone like Ansel Adams, he believed that over time he learned a lot about printing his negatives. So, for example, at some point he introduced using what's called a selenium toner to add a certain tonality to his prints. He believed that the prints using that selenium toner were superior to the prints without it. And therefore, he believed that prints that he made later in his career were better than the prints he'd made earlier from the same negative. Interesting. Which is the exact opposite of what collectors value. Uh -huh. right? Photography collectors value what are called vintage prints, mm -hmm. which are prints made around the time of the negative. Yeah, and so, especially as it pertains to collecting photographs, the terms type 1, type 2, mm. type 3, even type 4 have become much more commonly used. What gives a photo those distinctions, and do those carry well, any weight to you? No, none whatsoever. Why not? First of all, let's go over what they are. So type yeah. 1. So basically what happened is there's a huge market in vintage photographs. I mean, billions of dollars through Sotheby's and Christie's and Swan and others. And they've always used the same terminology, and that is a vintage print being something that was printed around the time of the negative. Mm -hmm. There's no hard and fast rule about what's a vintage print, but people can use their judgment if you give them certain information about when the print was made, how it was made. Someone came along in the baseball market and tried to simplify that for people who weren't as educated about printing photographs. Mm -hmm. And they came up with this type system where they tried to say a vintage print, we're going to call it a type 1 we're going to define it very tightly as something as taken within two years of the date of the negative, which is fine. I mean, any number you pick is going to be arbitrary. Mm -hmm. The problem with picking two years is that it's actually not possible to tell if a print was made within two years of the negative. You would be able to tell, I guess, in terms of like what materials were used, like if something hadn't been invented, like if you see certain materials or photo paper right. printing a 1918 photo and it's like, well, that paper wasn't even invented till 1951. Like that, right. you so can there, tell the opposite. For sure. Okay. So in the early 1950s, chemical brighteners were added to a layer of the paper mm -hmm. called baryta. Those chemical brighteners fluoresce when looked at under a black light. So you can tell if a print was made after the early 1950s or mm -hmm. before, depending on its fluorescence under a black light. Okay. If you're lucky enough to be looking at, let's say, a 1952 print, then using that fluorescence test, you might be able to tell within two years when it was printed. Mm -hmm. But there's no such technological innovation for 1918 that tells you if it's 1918 or 1921. Mm -hmm. 
if you're lucky, you can get it within 10 years with a lot of study. Mm -hmm. And I mean a lot of, like someone who's built up a library of antique papers and analyzed them. And there are people who do that as their livelihood, Mm -hmm. but they can't get within two years. No one can. So I'm troubled by the choice of two years as the window. So what they really rely on is not any property of the paper or the print. They rely on the stamp on the back. Right, which can obviously lead to... Exactly. There's a huge incentive for people to try to fake what's on the back of the print with this tight window. Mm -hmm. I think it's just not a constructive way to look at things. And so let's go through. So type one is a first generation photo developed from the original negative within the first two years of being taken. Type two is also developed from that original negative, but more than two years after it was taken. Right. So if you drop the two year window, Mm -hmm. someone who's just dealing in vintage photographs would say either this was taken around the time of the negative Mm -hmm. Or it was printed later. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a Chrissy's or Sotheby's catalog, they'll say, this print, printed later. Mm -hmm. It's not three years. Right. (laughs) In fact, for Chrissy's or Sotheby's, something printed within three years is clearly a vintage print. Interesting. So Ansel Adams. So an Ansel Adams printed within three years of the negative is a vintage print to Chrissy's and Sotheby's. And to Ansel Adams himself, it's actually less valuable. (laughs) Right. That's the irony. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So then type three would be a second generation photo. So that would be developed from a duplicate negative or a wire transmission? Like what? Well, not so much a wire transmission, but it's really a, um, I actually don't know the type system well enough. I try to avoid it wherever I can, but it's really a copy print. So it's either printed from a copy negative or it's a photograph of a photograph. Or if mm-hmm. you were like, if imagine if you have a Xerox of something and you make a Xerox of the Xerox, Yeah. a type three print as it's known in the photography market is worthless. Right. And then type four is even worse than that. Where yeah. it's, yeah. <laughs> Some people are familiar with the term glass plate negative. What mm-hmm. does that mean? An image is made through a chemical reaction. And typically the chemical that reacts with light is silver nitrate. That silver nitrate is a liquid and it needs to sit on a substrate. That substrate can be virtually anything. Mm-hmm. But to make a negative, it was originally glass Glass is easily broken and hard to carry a bag of glass negatives, obviously, if you're shooting one of the national parks, carrying a container full of 16 by 20 glass plate negatives is not an easy thing to do. Right. People did it. So glass was the original substrate for that silver nitrate to sit on. And then you actually need something to bind the silver nitrate to the glass. Mm -hmm. There's always a binder layer. So, for example, when you hear people talk about positives, you'll hear people talking about an albumin print. The albumin is literally the binder that binds the silver nitrate to the paper. What were some other binders that were used? So you'll hear people talk about silver gelatin prints. Mm -hmm. So gelatin is another binder. Mm -hmm. It's just binding the silver to the paper. Gotcha. What is an ambrotype? An ambrotype is something made according to a process called a wet plate. It actually involves taking a piece of glass, pouring collodion, also called gun cotton on it, which is the binder, and then pouring silver nitrate on it. And the silver nitrate is the chemical that reacts with light to produce the image. And then the image itself sits in those silver particles on the collodion on a piece of glass. It's actually a negative, so you can actually use that negative to print an albumin print. Or, if you don't want to use it as a negative, you can either paint it black on the other side or put a piece of black cloth behind it, whatever you want to do, and it turns it into a positive. Interesting. As a positive, it exists as what's called an ambrotype. Okay. But it can also be a glass plate negative for a collodion print. And that's what they did in the 1860s. Interesting. Okay. Because you've made ambrotypes and you've definitely studied the different processes. Those don't seem like things that most people would do unless they were trying them themselves. So are you also a photographer? I really wanted to learn these things because I really wanted to learn how to see. I went to the University of Virginia. I went to Harvard Business School. They're great schools. And I took art history at the University of Virginia. But I really felt like when I looked at a photograph, I didn't know why it was compelling. And I wanted to understand why. In particular, in 1993, I came across a book about Charles Conlon. It was part of a display about Father's Day. And they probably had, you know, 100 prints of this book of Conlon. And I picked it up and I looked at it and I just thought, these are the most compelling images I've ever seen. And why can't I explain why that's compelling to me? Mm -hmm. It's just a mystery. And then I thought, well, for me to really understand what makes these compelling, I need to be able to do it. So I just started learning any way I could to print. So I actually visited with someone who had rediscovered all of the 19th century processes. Someone who lived without electricity. He didn't even use a pen. To make an appointment with him, you had to send a letter in the mail, and he would write back to you in pencil. 
And then you would have to write back to him. And like after, you know, five or six go rounds through the mail, you could visit him in upstate New York near mm-hmm. the Finger Lakes. And you could camp near his encampment where he lived and learn how to make an amber type and learn how to make an albumin print, mm-hmm. how to make a tin type and all these 19th century processes. And after I could make it myself, I had a different understanding of what the photographer's limitations and constraints and opportunities were to express themselves. So I was talking to someone at a major museum, I won't say which museum, but he said a lot of the people who work for him in the museum have never tried to print using these various Mm -hmm. technologies. And they're all, you know, young people who grew up in the digital age, they know Photoshop, but if you hand them a piece of glass and a camera, they wouldn't know what to do. Right. I don't understand how you can really work in a major museum and not be fluent in all these processes. Mm Mm-hmm. I just think it's imperative to learn to really understand what you're looking at. So the the guy that you studied with, he didn't work at a major museum. Why was he interested in bringing back those old techniques and studying them and figuring them out for himself? It's a good question. He himself was a photographer. Mm -hmm. He was influenced by this one particular photographer who photographed some of the great national parks out west. And he got in a stagecoach with his horse, or team of horses, and literally rode the stagecoach out there with a 16 by 20 view camera and a bunch of glass negatives and recreated that whole journey. Awesome. And then he came back and decided that he would teach others how to do it, but only to the extent he really needed money because he was a hermit and didn't like interacting with people. He sounds awesome. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So I know you don't like the categorizations of type one, type two, but that's the terminology that's being used. For sure. So a type one is different from a negative in the sense that theoretically there can be dozens of type one photos of the same image if they just printed it a bunch of times, right? So there can only be one negative though. Correct. Okay. And those distinctions generally are supposed to give you an indication of the clarity of the photo in theory, correct? I actually, I'm, I'm not sure I would agree with that because after a photograph is printed, It goes through various pathways of aging. Mm -hmm. The paper itself can age. Mm -hmm. Changes can take place in the underlying paper and the binder layer and the silver. Mm -hmm. And those all have very different consequences for what happens to the image. So if there's image decay, which is really what's happening at the silver level, there can be mirroring in the image. There can be this warming, the sepia tone that the image takes on over time. Mm -hmm. It's actually a kind of decay that I enjoy and believe adds value to the image. Mm -hmm. But for someone who's very focused on condition, it makes it different than the day it was printed. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I would think worth less. But for some in the art market, and for me, it makes it worth more because what time has done to the image makes it more beautiful. Mm -hmm. There's a Japanese concept about that. The Japanese, for example, will take an ancient vase and it'll have a crack in it. And they'll celebrate that crack by filling it in with gold. For them, it's a celebration of the beauty of what age has done to the object. And I think for a lot of collectors of photography, there's something very similar about that, Mm -hmm. that age and history add beauty to the image. But for some people, they just want something that's looked like it's printed yesterday. Mm -hmm. That's someone's preference. It's not something wrong with it. Right. I don't want to ridicule it, but you have to keep an open mind about other ways of looking at it. Mm -hmm. So what is a contact print? So a contact print is a print made by putting the negative in direct contact with the paper. If you think about the game you played as a child when the teacher had a projector and the movie was over, everyone would hold up their hands to make animals on the screen. Mm -hmm. The closer your hand is to the screen, the more exact that animal will appear. The further away you are from the screen, Mm -hmm. the fuzzier the animal will appear. So if you're making a rabbit, for example, it'll be very fuzzy if you're far from the screen. If you have the negative directly on the paper, it's as clear as an image as you can ever produce. But you're limited by that choice in that your image has to be the exact same size as the negative. Mm -hmm. So if you have a 4 by 5 or a 5 by 7 negative, which are the common sizes, you know, you might want to wow someone with a 16 by 20 and you're not going to get that off of 5 by 7 negatives. Right. Then you have to make the choice of using an enlarger in the dark room. You put the negative up on the enlarger and it's like moving your hand away from the wall while that projector is going. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get a larger image, but but you're going to get a less distinct image. Yeah. So that is the distinction that the photographers make would be like, all right, am I going to use a four by seven glass plate or am I going to use a 16 by 20? So the pro is that you can get a much clearer, bigger image, but the con is that you've got to lug around a bunch of 16 by 20 pieces of glass through the national parks. Right. But you think about the amount of information that a 16 by 20 glass plate holds. If you're old enough to remember 35 millimeter film, 35 millimeter film is grainy. 
there is no grain in glass. Mm -hmm. If you have a 16 by 20 piece of glass with an image on it, there is a tremendous amount of information. I mean, I don't know what the megabyte equivalent would be in today's technology, but it's enormous. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much so that if you wanted to focus on someone's fingernail in a portrait, I mean, you could find detail in that fingernail. Wow. And that's what's so great about some of the photographers that I'm sure we're going to talk about today, about people like Charles Conlon, who used 5 by 7 glass negatives for a while, is that the negatives have so much information on them. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the photographers. Who was Carl J. Horner, and what are some of his most famous works? Horner was a studio photographer in Boston. According to at least one source, which I believe was Sporting Life, the newspaper, he was briefly the official photographer for Major League Baseball. And all of the baseball players of his era would visit his studio in Boston. He moved several times. I know at one point he was on Winter Street. And they would all come dressed in their uniforms or carrying their uniforms for their photo. And Horner was born, if I remember correctly, in Sweden and advertised himself as a European photographer. And by that, he meant not so much that he was born in Europe, which he was, I believe, in 1864, but that he had a European style, which meant that he was artistic in a way that other American photographers were not. And in particular, he was very influenced by Renaissance portraiture. And if you look at some Renaissance portraiture, there's a famous portrait of the Doge Loredan by Bellini, where the light falls on half of the Doge's face. And there's this idea that man is this kind of mixture of good and evil, and that light is meant to reflect that. Horner consciously tries to mimic that lighting in his studio and tries to mimic the effect that certain Roman bust portraiture has. He's capturing these men as heroes of their time. There's absolutely no question that that's how he wants his subjects to be perceived. It's very different than people taking selfies today and posting them on a, <laughs> social media. Right. I mean, these, these are photographs that, like, I mean, they're supposed to project the greatness of their subjects for all time. Mm -hmm. Where would his works turn up? Like, how were they used? Most famously, they were used in a series of baseball cards called the T206 series, which began in 1909 and I believe finished in 1911. And they're widely collected today. They're a significant part of the Burdick collection at the Met, which is a donation of over 300,000 objects, which is just an absolute mind-boggling collection. Yeah. I know you went there today. It's just... It was awesome. To think that someone could collect 300,000 objects. And catalog and them. And catalog them, <laughs> which I believe took him 10 or 15 years of, of yeah. everyday work. Yes. I mean, the commitment is itself a work of art. And the fact that he was the guy who invented the categorization system. Right. Oh, I mean, like, it doesn't stop. His, his, right. his contribution... What an impressive... Is, is almost limitless. Yeah. But it's also what he did in a way was art. As a collector, he was an artist. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. I don't think that it's just artists who are artists. I think collectors can be artists by the way they juxtapose things and the stories they tell with what they buy, what they collect. And I think Burdick was a true artist and really his contributions are underappreciated. Kind of along those lines, there was a guy named Charles Schwartz who had an idea mm -hmm. of double vintage. Right. What was that? So Schwartz's idea, and he was really referring more to Civil War portraiture, in which the subjects were posing with their armaments. So there'd be a Union soldier with a gun. And the ambrotype, let's say, of that soldier would survive, or a tintype of that soldier would survive, and handed down through the family would be the gun that was used in that portrait. Mm -hmm. And Schwartz had this idea of a double vintage because he would own both the positive, the, the tintype or the ambrotype or whatever it was, and the gun. Mm -hmm. So he was photo matching game used bats. Right, right exactly. He just didn't call it that. <laughs> right. But it's actually an idea that hasn't caught on so much among baseball collectors. Which is strange because they're doing it without knowing that they're doing it. Right. And I think now that photography is becoming such a recognized and celebrated art form in specifically baseball, but sports history, those two worlds are going to collide at some point. And I think it's on the very near horizon. For a long time, I... I devoted my collecting journey towards obtaining images taken by Charles Conlon. Mm -hmm. And I wanted desperately to find anything I could that was in a Conlon image. I didn't actually find the exact object that was in the Conlon image, but I had many instances of something that was identical to what was in the Conlon image. And that always meant something to me. Yeah. Yeah, we did the same thing at the museum. We've got very few photos of the inside of the house while Joe and Katie lived there, but we've got one image of Joe in the living room holding a trophy, sitting on a, on a little chair. 
And I spent eight months driving around the country finding all of the artifacts that were in that image. So, you know, the 1929 radio that's behind him in the corner. Oh, wow. That's like I literally drove to New York to pick up the actual R32 Victor really? radio and okay. had a guy in Georgia refurbish it for me. So I did that with the big radio on the bottom of the photo. And there's a smaller radio on top of it, 1941 General Electric L630. So like all the different pieces... And so we recreated that corner of the house in the museum. And no, it's not the actual radio he touched, but it's the exact make and model, same time. It's not a reproduction. It's not some modern. I took it to a carpenter and was like, hey, can you build me something that looks like that? Like I found an actual piece. And those displays kind of, I wouldn't say blow people away, but it definitely adds to the experience. And people appreciate that kind of level of attention to detail, I think. Exactly. I mean, you know exactly what I'm talking about then. It's uh, that quest for authenticity. Yeah. And there are people out there who do collect the original photos, which were used for the T206 cards or other card sets, and then have the actual card as well displayed next to the photo. Do you think that that is double vintage in a sense? Because it's not that he's got the uniform that the guy's wearing in the photo. How would you categorize that? I think it's interesting to try to do. I mean, I... I get a little charged when I find the original newspaper in which one of the images I was on was printed or the baseball card in which the image I was on was used as the model. I think for the baseball cards themselves, it's overemphasized. Mm-hmm. I mean, the value for something that matches a card is astronomically higher. I don't understand why that exists as opposed to, you know, finding the newspaper where it's printed or, or any other use. Mm-hmm. I don't understand the premium for a card. Mm, yeah. But anything that adds to the story to understand how it was used by the people who first saw the image and mm-hmm. how it was consumed was part of the story of the image. And I think anything you can add to the story of the image is a positive. So we talked about how Horner was a studio photographer. What then was a Graflex and how did its invention change things? So the Graflex was a huge innovation in photography. Photographers like Horner had really been confined to the studio. And in a studio, you're using a skylight with a northern exposure. And there's very little you can do. If you look at Horner, I mean, he kind of had a a methodology. And sometimes he would go for that left-right distinction in lighting on a face. And sometimes he would alter it a little. He typically went for a small area of light underneath one of the eyes. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's called Rembrandt lighting. Mm -hmm. But you got someone in a chair under a light that doesn't move. There's not a lot you can do on a daily basis to see the world in a new way. Mm-hmm. The Graflex freed you from the limitations of the studio and allowed you to go to where your subject worked. And so Conlon, being an example, he would go to the baseball stadium as opposed to requiring the baseball players to come to him. Mm-hmm. And he could ask them to stand up against the roof of the polo grounds, which he used as a background circa 1913 asked him to stand up and just shoot them. And and with the Graflex, he could frame the image very differently. So when you're working on a view camera in a studio, you compose the image. And basically, when you click the shutter, you can't see anything anymore. Whereas in the Graflex, you could compose the image right up to the second that you wanted to shoot, and your your subject could be moving. Mm -hmm. That's not happening in a studio. Right. It's a much more dynamic relationship with your subject. It's a little less intimidating, I think, not to be in a studio setting. And I think it brings out a different relationship you have with the subject when you're not confined to that studio relationship. Yeah. And like you said, it makes them feel more comfortable because they're just doing what they do. Right. They're in their environment. They're in their milieu and not in in a studio, which is the photographer's place of work. Right. So it's up to the photographer to catch them doing what they're used to doing instead of the subjects posing. Right. And you can really achieve some bold framing with a Graflex that you can't achieve with a view camera. Interesting. And there are some extreme close-ups that Colin took in 1913, 1914. Yeah. Where he's so close to the subject that if you zero in on the eyes of the subject, you can see Conlon in his iris. Right. You're not going to get that in a Horner portrait. Right. Yeah. We will definitely get to that series of photos from Conlon. But before we do, who was Francis P. Burke? So Francis P. Burke was a Chicago-based photojournalist who photographed all different kinds of things from immigration to the circus. In 1912, struck a partnership with someone named Henry Atwell, and it is believed that he was the official photographer for the Chicago Cubs. And he continued in that capacity for a long time, really until circa 1929, when another photographer named George Burke, according to Burke's assistant, the Cubs looked for a photographer named Burke. They were looking for Francis. They found George in the directory. They called George by accident and said, come over and take photographs of us. 
not realizing that they'd had Francis on call for 20 years, whatever it was. <laughs> and George Burke showed up, and then later with his assistant, George Brace, who I met in the mid-1990s, who's a you know, very nice older gentleman. And what really blew my mind, actually, when I shook George Brace's hand, George Brace had photographed George Wright, I believe, in 1937. And when I shook his hand, he told me that he had once shaken hands with George Wright, who was on the 1869 Red Stockings, which brought me back to the book that I read yeah. in fifth grade. And that's the opening chapters about the 1869 Red Stockings and that he had had a relationship with that man. And it was a, like almost like time travel. Yeah. It was incredible to meet someone like that. I mean, I, I don't think George Burke and George Brace were anywhere near the photographer that Francis Burke was, but they were still a part of history. Absolutely. And when you can tie those two periods of time, I mean, that's a 130 year span connected by a handshake. Like, right. This is the age of Ulysses S. Grant. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're, this is American history at this exactly. point. It's not baseball history. Exactly. Like, it's crazy. I loved meeting George Brace. And he was a very nice man. I, I bought a print he made of Mel Ott. It actually turned out not to be Mel Ott. I, I looked at it. I said, are you sure this is Mel Ott? He was sure. He was very good friends with Mel Ott. It turned out not to be Mel Ott. I asked him to write a letter explaining his relationship with Mel Ott, which he did. I don't know what I'm going to do with that letter now that it has nothing to do with the print that I bought. I um, just need to find a different <laughs> image that he took of Mel. <laughs> exactly. But he was a, a very nice man. He had a, a collection of a million negatives that he was trying like to monetize. literally one million? One million yeah, negatives. Yeah. He asked for a dollar a piece, which at the time I didn't have to pay him. It was certainly worth it. I was just a few years out of business school. I had a negative net worth for a while, and that was not going to be achieved. One of the wonders of my odyssey in photography is meeting all these old photographers. And I met George Brace, so I have this link to George Burke, and I have this link to Francis Burke. I spent a couple of days with Nat Fine, whom I really had kind of an affection for. He was a wonderful man. I met Harry Harris, who was standing next to Nat Fine in 1948. And I met Neil Leifert, who was arguably the greatest Sports Illustrated photographer of all time. Yeah. So all these relationships are just part of my experience of learning, and um, it's been a really rewarding part of that experience. A lot of Francis Burke's images ended up getting used for Cracker Jack baseball cards or in other advertisements and publications. To baseball collectors, his images are ubiquitous and often instantly recognizable. Why don't more people know who he is? That's a great question. If I were to guess, I would say that it's because very few vintage prints of his, or if you will, type one prints of his, exist. Mm -hmm. And because of that, because he can't be widely collected, people aren't invested in him as a photographer. Interesting. They're not rooting for his prints to be worth more because they don't own them. Mm -hmm. There's a tremendous kind of lobby, if you will, among people who own certain photographers. Who They're not actually photographers, but they're actually news services, and they think they're photographers, and I'm referring specifically to Paul Thompson. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of huge lobby supporting the prints of Paul Thompson, when he's not even a photographer. And if you say anything about Paul Thompson, people go crazy. Is it the same kind of thing with George Grantham Bain? Where, I mean, he was actually a photographer though, right? No. No, he wasn't? No. Oh, wow. I thought he was. No. I actually read Bain's memoirs, which are housed at the New York Public Library. Mm -hmm. And he's quite clear that he was never a photographer. I mean, he did take a few photographs in the same way that I've written one essay, but it doesn't make me a writer. Mm -hmm. And in his memoirs, he actually says that he got into an argument with a member of Paul Thompson's family a relative of his once claimed that Paul Thompson was the first man to handle news photographs. George Grantham Bain wrote, He was mistaken. Paul Thompson was editor of a sporting magazine, and I sold him news photographs before the magazine failed. After the failure, he took its picture file as the nucleus of a picture collection on which to build up a business. Paul Thompson was not himself a news photographer, neither was I. These guys keep falling back on the fact that in 1908, they believe Paul Thompson took an image of Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. George Grantham Bain himself is explicit that he was not a photographer. I don't really understand why people get so defensive about it yeah. or so invested in that answer. Yeah, interesting. Particularly when these men, you know, in Bain's case, came out directly and said, I'm not a photographer. Yeah. And in Thompson's case, there's overwhelming evidence he was not a photographer. You've described Francis Burke as being Wally Pipped by George Burke, yeah. who was also a baseball photographer in the early 20th century. You've described Francis by saying Burke was not a baseball photographer, but a photographer who covered baseball. Who do you consider to be the first baseball photographer? Unquestionably, Charles M. Conlon. And why is that unquestionable? There were many people before Conlon who photographed baseball back at least in the 1860s. It's possible it's the 1850s, but those prints don't survive. 
There are copies of 1850s prints, but there are no known photographers from the 1850s. If you go back even further to the 1840s, I'll just mention in passing that Henry T. Anthony, who was ultimately joined his brother in the Anthony Brothers business, which was one of the major photography businesses of the middle 19th century, he was an original player on the original Knickerbockers in 1846, a major figure in the history of American photography, and someone with very important patents and innovations in the history of photography. I mean, there were a lot of people who took photographs. For example, Edward Moybridge was a famous photographer who at UPenn photographed a lot of the athletes in action. He was potentially suffered from some brain damage from a wagon accident he was in. No one really understands exactly what drove him, but he changed the spelling of his name after that accident and became one of the fathers of the moving image and photographed hundreds or thousands of images of people in motion and animals in motion. He was the first person to show that all of a horse's hoofs left the ground when it was in gallop. Interesting. And he was a huge influence on Thomas Edison. But he didn't hang out at a baseball stadium all year. <laughs> right. First person ever to do that was Charles Conlon. And where was he based out of Conlon? So Conlon was in New York. It's interesting to me that all of the main photographers that we've mentioned were based out of cities where they had an American League and a National League team. That doesn't seem like it was a coincidence. It's interesting. Um, I think it has to do in part with the growth of photography departments at newspapers. Mm -hmm. so the larger cities were the first to afford. But Cleveland had, you know, multiple newspapers, but they didn't have American and National League. That's interesting. So New York, Boston, Chicago, you're seeing every single team come through town at least once. Right. It's interesting. So if you look at the early news agencies like Bain and Thompson, mm -hmm. they gravitated towards baseball. So the question is why? So if you're hired to photograph spot news for a newspaper, there could be a mugging you need to photograph or a murder. They're not planned in advance. Later on, someone like Arthur Fellig, who's known as Ouija, who had reinvented crime photography. Ouija was the one who traveled with a police radio and was always the first on the scene for a murder or a fire or something like that. You don't need that for baseball. Baseball's scheduled in advance and it's newsworthy. So if you work for Bain, you know you need someone to photograph the first hit of the Yankee game. Mm -hmm. And you don't need him where there more than 10 minutes. He knows when the first inning is. He just needs to hang out till there's a hit. Then he can go home and capture something else. So how did Conlon get his start in photography in general? Because he didn't start out as a baseball photographer. He Not became at all. one. He was a landscape photographer. Right. A hobby landscape photographer. Here I can only speculate, but there was an editor of the sporting department at the Evening Telegram which employed Conlon as a proofreader named John B. Foster. And if you wanted to photograph baseball, Foster was the best person you could have a relationship with because he was not only the sporting editor of the Evening Telegram, but he was the deputy editor of the Spalding Guide, which was something like the official yearbook of Major League Baseball at the time. Mm -hmm. And he ultimately became secretary of the Giants and could act as a go-between between a photographer and all these various entities that employed him. And he picked Conlon in 1904 to take shots for the Spalding Guide. And the question is why? The story that Conlon told was that Conlon had taken images of an intramural game between two departments, the editorial department and some other department at the Evening Telegram, and that Foster really liked those images. I'm not sure that's the whole story. <laughs> it could be, but it just happens that the Spalding Guide, I believe, was unionized, and the Evening Telegram was unionized, and Conlon was just about to join the board of the union, which was one of the most powerful unions in the United States, the Big Six Typographical Union. Mm -hmm. And in 1906, I believe, he would become the chairman, either 05 or 06. So if you were going to reward anybody and try to co-opt them, if you will, mm -hmm. the chairman of a union would be a good person to try to get on your side. Interesting. The only thing that makes me more likely to believe that conspiracy theory, if you will, is that I don't think Colin was that good for a very long time. <laughs> I really believe from 1904 to 1910, Conlon was just an average photographer. Mostly taking action shots. Right. Basically, starting in 1911, that's when he suddenly turned to portraiture. Why did that happen? So again, I can only speculate, but in 1909 and 1910, the first lithographs that were done, called the T205 and T206 series, were being produced by the cigarette companies. And the T205 series in particular, which I believe is a 1911 issue, all require close-up illustrations, mm -hmm. which are based on photographs. So I believe that the American Tobacco Company, which sponsored that issue of T205 baseball cards, hired the Paul Thompson Agency to take extreme close-up portraits of every member of Major League Baseball, which from a portrait perspective were extremely innovative. 
I believe that the reason the photographs were so innovative wasn't because the Paul Thompson agency was so innovative, but it was because of the artistic conception of whoever conceived of the T205 baseball card series. They said, look, we want to do close-up illustrations on these cards, and to make these illustrations, we're going to need photographs, and to get these photographs, we're going to hire one of the agencies, and it happened to be Paul Thompson. But they're wonderful portraits, and I believe taken by multiple photographers. And why did they use the illustrations on the cards? They had the images. They had the photos. Why didn't they just use photos? Clearly, the technology was there that you could print photos. It's interesting. The T205s themselves, the colors are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I really just think it's artistic choice. Yeah. You could have used the photos. I mean, people were using photographs and cards as early as the early 1860s. Certainly by the late 1880s, they were using the old judge photographs. You could have used them. But the color they used on the T205 portraits is just astounding. Mm -hmm. Conlon obviously worked in a time before television or the internet. So early on, where would his images be produced? Like, where would his work appear? It was primarily in the Spalding Guide, which is like the yearbook for Major League Baseball. There would be uh, a page with half a dozen or so portraits on it. And someone who was a young baseball fan could read that and understand what happened in the previous year in baseball, look at some of the statistics, see a portrait of everyone they could ever name in Major League Baseball, and then buy all of the products that were offered by the Spalding Company. Hmm. In the May 29th, 1909 issue of Sporting Life, they reference a Boston Globe article which asked why photographers always take photos of ballplayers at the end of their swing when they're batting instead of before when the player would look more natural. What do you think is the answer to that question? Because it's something I've always wondered, too. So many of the photos we see of Joe Jackson in particular, it's at the end of his swing where he's leaning all the way forward. And you look at a picture like that and you're like, how did this guy bat 356? He can't even be balanced. (laughs) So why was that the approach when they were taking photos back then? They're really struggling with the shutter speed. So to try to get the bat meeting the ball was just too difficult. Again, we talked about the problems of lugging glass plate negatives to the ballpark when you're carrying a bunch of 5 by 7 glass negatives. It's just not easy to work with that medium. When you miss, it's kind of expensive. Mm. So you want to take a shot that you know you're going to hit with reasonable expectation, and that's either before the swing or after the swing. After is just easiest. I really think that's the answer. Yeah. All artists have tendencies in the work, and when we speak of Conlon's tendencies, he knew what worked and usually played it safe. Of course, there are exceptions. For instance, if you look at nearly every Conlon image of a left-handed batter, you'll notice that Conlon is behind the batter. He planned to capture each hitter after his swing. Every image that is except for one of Butch Smith swinging on October 24th, 1914, which was published in the 1915 Spalding Guide. What does it tell us about Conlon's thought process behind getting that shot? I think in that particular case, it was more likely batting practice or Schmidt potentially hitting balls out to people on his team in practice. Mm so that his swing speed's not going to be as great, so that he could finally get the image he wanted, which was the action shot as opposed to the before shot or the after shot. He wanted the bat meeting the ball. And if you get someone to slow his swing speed enough, Mm -hmm. you could finally capture it. Interesting. So he knew the shot he wanted, but knew that it wasn't easy to get. So instead he would go and get the easy shot. Interesting. Yeah, I had never really considered that. Christy Matthewson once famously told a small group of skeptics, Charlie can be trusted always, in reference to Charles Conlon. And it was partly this trusting relationship that he formed with his subjects which led to his success. What did Conlon do differently than other photographers to gain the trust of the people he was shooting? It's a great question. It's a very complex question. I think part of it is, I'm just speculating, Charlie Conlon was Irish. The New York Giants of 1904 were an extremely Irish team. Mm -hmm. I believe more than half Irish. It wasn't easy to be Irish in New York at the turn of the century. There was a famous song back then called These Are All Good American Names. And this was a song that was celebrated all these Irish names. And the lyrics contain all these Irish names. And when the lyricist came up with these names, it's almost like the entire giant lineup. And McGraw, who was the manager of the Giants at that time, was Irish. And he took a liking to Conlon, possibly because he was introduced by John B. Foster. So Mm. it was all kind of in the family. And then Conlon formed a good relationship with Christy Matheson, who was not Irish, but so much of the team was Irish that I I really believe that helped Conlon bond with the Giants and acted as a platform for him, forming relationships throughout the league. And we think that one of Conlon's first images ever taken, if not the first baseball image, was of Christy Matheson, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's what he said. There were a couple instances, though, where Conlon kind of betrayed that trust, right? Yes, it's a little unsettling to think about, actually. 
What were I mean, some Conlon of those spent so much of his life trying to gain the trust of these men, in particular Matthewson, and there's that famous story you related where at a diner after one of the World Series games, it's not known exactly when it was, Conlon actually got the date wrong in the story. The way he told the story, I believe it was 1905, but I can't assert that for certain. Matthewson said to Roger Bresnahan and others, Charlie can be trusted always. And as a photographer, there is nothing that can happen to you that's better than that. To have the Steph Curry of baseball of his day, I mean, someone who's like a living god, mm-hmm. to tell all of his teammates, you can always trust this man. You will always get different images than anyone else if you can get someone to say that to your subjects. Right. I mean, that guarantees you a different result. Well, first of all, just the access itself. It's more than just access. It's, it is access. It's the way people relate to the camera when they can trust you. In the same way that I'm sitting here, I have a prior relationship with you, I trust you, and I'm very free with what I'm saying, I'm, I feel relaxed, there's no meta-thinking about what I'm about to say, mm-hmm. I'm trying to be kind of in flow. If I don't trust you, that's never going to happen. Right. And if I'm a subject for a photograph and I trust the photographer, when I take a photograph of my girlfriend, that's different than any photograph that anyone else is going to take of her. Right. She trusts me totally. Yeah. Something that you work your entire career trying to build. And he got it possibly in 1905 when he was just starting. I mean, I'm speculating, but I believe it was 05. But if it's true, I mean, he's a year in and he's got the The person, the rubber stamp of the, you know, the authority in all of baseball telling everyone, trust this man, pose for him, relax in front of his camera. And so what were some of the instances of Conlon maybe betraying that trust a little bit? So around 1913, maybe 1912... He started to become interested in baseball players aging. He took a photograph of Matthewson, and on the back he wrote something about Matthewson's crow's feet appearing. And again, I'm speculating. I actually don't think that Conley knew that much about baseball. I think he was a very casual fan. Mm -hmm. Had never really played at any real level himself. Didn't really know the game. And came up with some strange theories. One theory, he floated to Home Run Baker once, where he used a metaphor from photography where when light bounces off the negative, the, he had this idea of the angle of incidence, the angle of reflection, and he tried to communicate to Baker this complicated thought that he didn't fully understand that the baseball would come into the bat at the angle of incidence and come off the bat at the angle of reflection. And he tried to relate that to photography, and Baker said, I don't have any idea what you're talking about, but I know if someone like hangs a fat pitch, I'm going to hit it out of the park. Mm-hmm. To me, that's kind of Conlon's level of understanding, but he came up with this theory possibly that he could understand why a baseball player was declining in his performance by photographing his eyes. I'm not sure how anyone could understand the validity of that thought, but he started to take portraits of aging baseball players to try to explain the decline in their performance using images. There's a famous series of portraits by Conlon of the murders of Yankees, which shows extreme close-ups of the players' faces zeroed down on their eyes. But Conlon was into taking more artsy photos like that, and he had a series with a focus like that, I thought, from 1914. You think they're as early as 1912 and 13? Well, I think some of the images of Matheson were 1912, but the photographic essay you're referring to is 1913, 1914. Okay. Why do you think that that's something he was so specifically interested in depicting? And what do you think gave him the idea that you could tell how a player was aging by looking at his eyes? I'd only be guessing. Mm Mm-hmm. I think he was particularly close to some of the players who wound up being featured in that essay, among them Hannes Wagner, Mm -hmm. who was into his 40s when this essay was undertaken. Chief Myers, who had begun declining, was someone very close to Matthewson and to McGraw. So it involved, I think, something that some of his favorite subjects were experiencing, this decline. Mm -hmm. And I think he was struggling for a way to capture that using his camera. But how does that betray them? Because it's... Well, it betrays them in that the way they were used. So in Baseball Magazine, which became one of his principal employers, I think in 1916 or 1917, those images were reproduced with rather insulting captions and rather insulting descriptions in the body of the essay. And would those accompanying write-ups have been written by Conlon or by F.C. Lane? So they were written by F.C. Lane, who was the editor of Baseball Magazine. But if Lane did it without Conlon's permission, I can't imagine him not getting Conlon in trouble for this. Mm -hmm. If I were Chief Myers and I read something about eye strain being the cause of my precipitous decline in performance and it being accompanied by a photograph that I trusted Charles Conlon to take, I would not be very happy about it. Yeah. 
And uh, you wouldn't trust him in the future to take that same photo. And I wouldn't trust photo. him in the future. I, mean, I can't imagine someone like Jeter or A-Rod consenting to anyone to take a photograph of their aging eyes to understand their decline. Well, I mean, you want to do apples to apples. A modern example is Michael Jordan being on the cover of Sports Illustrated, bag at Michael, when he wasn't doing well at baseball and literally has never given a, another interview to Sports <laughs> Illustrated since then. It's been 20 years. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, take <laughs> that's, there's nothing more important than trust in, in life, but, right. especially but especially in a business in, like this. And also, just in photography, there's something very personal about giving yourself over as a subject. There's just a vulnerability to it. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that Conlon was still shooting those same types of shots 15 years apart, you know, doing the 1912, 1913, 1914 series, and then the, the Murders Row series in 27. But it wasn't just eyes that Conlon focused on. He also had photos of players' hands, specifically the batting grips of hitters and the pitching grips of pitchers. Were other photographers doing this type of thing before Conlon, or was he kind of the guy who paved the way? I believe at the time he first started in 1913-ish, he was really the pioneer in those kinds of shots. And I believe it was born of a certain naivete about baseball. It was really like his lack of knowledge that drove him to take these images. I think he was trying to figure it out for himself. Of course, they're not read that way today at all. Mm -hmm. They're read today more as... He loved the game so much, he wanted to know every detail. But but that's part of it. But also, if you look at any system over time, and Stephen Jay Gould wrote about this, there's a decline in variation over time. It happens if you look at the size of dinosaurs over time. But it also happens if you look at why there are no 400 hitters. It's because the standard deviation of any system declines with time. So the standard deviation of batting average has declined with time. And if you look at Conlon's images, the variation in batting grips has declined precipitously with time. So mm-hmm. you had someone like Ty Cobb holding the bat with a split grip. I don't think you can find that anywhere in Major League Baseball today. Mm-hmm. You had some people like Shoeless Joe Jackson, who was holding it over the end of the bat like Babe Ruth to really swing for the fences. I'm not sure anyone holds it over the end of the bat anymore, mm-hmm. but certainly people are swinging more like Shoeless Joe and Babe Ruth today. But some of those, the Heine grows of the world don't exist anymore. The Ty Cobbs of the world don't exist anymore. And you see all that variation in Conlon's photo essay, and that variation is gone. Essentially, Mm -hmm. everyone holds the bat the same way. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thought. Conlon also liked to photograph the hands of catchers. What was something surprising that you noticed about the catcher's hands the more you studied those images? Interestingly, I thought that the damage would be experienced by the catching hand. Originally, I thought maybe the gloves weren't good enough and you'd catch enough 95-mile-an-hour fastballs or whatever the speed was then, and you'd break various bones in your hand trying to catch those balls. But it's actually the opposite hand that suffered all the damage. So the early catcher's gloves didn't have a crease in them so that they could flex and capture the ball in the middle of the glove. So what you'd have to do instead is kind of like a patty cake sandwich to bring your hands together and capture the ball between your two hands. Well, that creates a vulnerability because as your free hand, the one that doesn't have the glove on, it comes towards the other hand to try to bring things together. If there's a foul ball or something comes right off the bat and you don't time it perfectly, you could wind up with that ball spinning into your non-protected hand. Yeah. It's actually the non-protected hand that wound up with all the damage. And there's some pretty gnarly photos. Yeah, uh, I mean, and... the early catcher's images are awful. There's a catcher in particular named Jimmy Archer. I mean, they say in the photo essay that accompanied it, I'm not sure if it's true, but that he basically broke every single bone in his hand. And looking at it, it certainly seems possible. Right. <laughs> yeah. Especially that pinky. Yeah. It's like the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. So what was the first Conlon you ever purchased, and how did you stumble upon it? I was at the National Baseball Card Convention, and there was someone with two Conlons on their table. One was Big Ed Walsh's spitball grip, which was the cover image of the monograph by Neil and Constance McCabe, which I'd seen in a Father's Day display in 1993 at Bloomingdale's, and which in a way changed the course of my life. I saw that book, and I was so blown away by the images. It brought me back to the book that I'd purchased as a fifth grader about the glory years of baseball, but it was at a whole different level because it was visually stunning. And I just looked at that book, and I'm like, why am I responding like this? It just doesn't even make sense. And if it makes sense, I can't explain it. But I need to be able to explain it. I have no idea how. <laughs> it's going to take a lot of learning. Mm-hmm. But it's such a mystery to me that I can't not be able to explain this. And the cover image was Big Ed Walsh's spitter. And there in front of me is a contact print, 5 by 7 printed by Conlon 
of Walsh's spitter grip with this unbelievable sepia toning that I don't believe Conlon imparted to the print himself. I believe it happened through image decay, which again is appealing to me because it tells you that you're looking at a vintage print. It tells you that time has made its mark on this image and it just adds to its beauty. And he also had an image that was in the interior of the book, which was Eddie Seacott's knuckleball grip, Eddie Seacott being a teammate of Shoeless Joe Jackson, and really probably the most important part of the conspiracy because he was an important pitcher and a pitcher controls the game. And I said to the dealer, how much do you want for these two images? And he said something like $85. And I said, I'll give you 70 And he said, okay. And I was so excited <laughs> that he recognized instantly that he'd made a mistake. And he said to me, I sold those two cheap, didn't I? You should have held out for 85 <laughs> <laughs> And I tried to make him feel better. I said, you know, like, no, oh, like, I think you did fine. Like, I just love these images. And I went back and I just, I mean, it was a, an absolutely life-changing moment, right? I held these two things in my hand. And I just thought, I own two of the most beautiful images I've ever seen. And even more than that, when I'd read the original monograph by the McCabes, which is an excellent work, and I have utmost respect for the McCabes, but I believe they made one mistake. Which was? In the introduction, they said, we have chosen to print from the original negatives because the vintage prints were damaged irreparably in newspaper offices decades ago, and it is not possible to produce an art book using the original prints. And I'm looking at these two prints, and I'm thinking, you couldn't be more wrong. These prints are so gorgeous. There's nothing you could do with the original negs to make a modern print that touches what I'm holding. Mm -hmm. And I kind of resolved at that moment to build a collection. I'm like, I've got the cover image. So, and know, one of the ones inside. And one of the ones inside. Yeah. And I'm like, this is a good start. So now I've got like another couple hundred images to buy. Yeah, you're 1% <laughs> of the way there. Exactly. So why not start now? Yeah. And I know that I can accomplish what they say is impossible in the forward, which is that a book of vintage prints can't be better than a book of modern prints of Collins. And I just thought to myself, how is that possible? Well, not when I'm holding what I'm holding. I mean, this is treasure. How did you think that that goal was achievable? How did you think you were going to be able to find the other prints? I had no idea. Prints? I had no idea. But I just thought if I'm lucky enough to find these two, mm -hmm. you know, I've got another 40 years and... <laughs> I can sit out on my journey and see what, what comes up. <laughs> there have been hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of baseball photos taken in history. So when you decided that this was something you wanted to start collecting, how did you pick a focus? Because no matter how hard you try, it is impossible to collect them all. Right. So what were the things that you were really focusing on? It's interesting. I just saw a movie by a very famous photographer named Stephen Wilkes, who I adore. I love his work. He lives in Westport, Connecticut, where I live. I met him once at a museum, and he did a documentary about a photographer who was a major influence on his life named Jay Maisel, called Jay Myself. And Maisel closes the movie by saying, we don't take pictures. We are taken by pictures. And I think that's what happened with me and those two images. I didn't so much set out to collect Conlon as I was taken by those pictures, and I couldn't not do it. Oftentimes, there's a difference between being a collector and being a scholar. So what made you also want to study Conlon as opposed to just collecting him? It goes back to those earliest thoughts of trying to understand why I'm responding the way I'm responding, trying to come up with the best explanation. And the best explanation to me was to collect any photographs that I found compelling and then to do whatever I had to do to understand the best explanation as to why it was compelling for me. It was this mystery that I just had to answer. And I, it's not like I have the answer today, but I'm much more articulate about it today than I was in 1993. Mm -hmm. But it'll always be a mystery, I think, as to what is so compelling about these images. There's a million baseball photographers over history. We've already talked about a half dozen of them. When you see a print or an image that Conlon took, do you know right away, like, oh, that's Conlon? I never have to look at the back. What are the telltale signs? Like, what gives a Conlon away? I mean, there's a more prosaic answer that I'll get to in a second, but... Conlon just has a uniqueness that the other photographers don't have. This was his hobby, but it was his really only hobby. It was a hobby that he completely dedicated himself to from 1904 to 1943. It's an enormous period of time. And 
I never have to turn over to look at the back stamp to see if it's got Conlon's stamp on the back. I know right away when I'm looking at a Conlon. I would say with at least a 95% accuracy. But that's part of what makes Conlon a good photographer. If you can't do that, you're not a good photographer. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I look at a Walker Evans, I don't have to turn it over to look at see if it's Walker Evans. I know a Walker Evans from a mile away because mm -hmm. he's an American original. Same with Lou Hine. Same with Deanne Arbus. Any great photographer, that's the case. I mean, no one has to look at the back of a Deanne Arbus. I mean, Deanne Arbus screams to you, this is Deanne Arbus, and there's no one like her in the history of photography. They have their own voice. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So there's a famous Shakespearean actor named Mark Rylance who's become a famous actor in Hollywood, and he said that the whole purpose of acting is to make someone experience something that they've seen many times in a whole new way. So he'll portray a Shakespearean character in a way that's never been expressed before. And that's his whole reason for being. As a collector, you specifically like going after contact prints when possible. Is there a contact print made for every negative, or is that a choice that... No, it's, it's totally a choice of the photographer or whoever's doing the printing for the photographer, because some photographers don't do their own printing. Printing is a very different skill. There's no reason a photographer has to do their own printing. When I was in business, for example, I was an investor. I was a very good investor. I wasn't a very good marketer. There's no reason someone who's good at investing should also be a good marketer. So I try to hire someone to do marketing for me who's better at marketing. And this is the same for a photographer. If you're not a darkroom wizard, there's no reason you should do your own printing. In 1913, Charles Conlon estimated that he had taken 10,000 images. By 1942, when his career was winding down, that number is probably closer to like 40,000. So it stands to reason that somebody else was developing his photos in most instances, right? Correct. Because how could he have had the time to shoot and develop that many images? Do we know with certainty who some of the people who were printing his images, when it wasn't him doing it, do we know who the people were that were? We actually have no idea, but we can speculate. So the images that he was printing for the Evening Telegram, for example, when the Evening Telegram was his employer, they tend to be more rushed in their printing, and they tend to be enlargements. I believe those are printed by other people. But sometimes when I see a print, like the first print that I've ever purchased of Conlon's shot of Big Ed Walsh's spitball grip that was on the cover of the McKay book, it's so perfectly printed. It's possible it was printed by someone else, but to me it betrays a certain pride in what someone's doing. And I think more likely to have been printed by Conlon. Interesting. You don't just collect photos, though. You've owned some other pretty incredible pieces over the years, from the Merkel's boner baseball to game-used bats from every starter on the 1927 Murders Row Yankees. What was the hardest piece for you to acquire? There are a couple. Some of collecting depends on your financial wherewithal. So there are people who are literally billionaires who can never be outbid. If they decide they want something, they just bid until they get it because they have deeper pockets than anyone could ever imagine. And to me, the collections they build are impressive, but not as impressive as someone who's on a budget. Mm -hmm. I really like to see someone who's on an extreme budget and can still pull off the impossible and rely on their own cunning and skills to find the objects and not necessarily buy them at auction where they're going to be top dollar, but to hunt down the families where the artifacts reside or find any other method they can to build what they can on their budget. And there are some incredible collectors who've been able to do that. When I started... I was at a business school, and I had a negative net worth. And I could afford like $1,000, $2,000, but a $10,000 object at the time. I mean, even coming out of a famous business school, like, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I just couldn't do it. You know, I had $100,000 of debt. And um, one of the first things I wanted to do was to acquire every baseball where there's a change in the design of the ball in the entire history of the game starting in the 1840s. And up came for auction the first baseball ever patented in the United States. Not only was it the first baseball ever patented, it was the actual patent model sent by the inventor to the patent office, deaccessioned by the patent office in the 1920s with the original patent label. And it went for over $10,000. It went to a very well-known dealer who ultimately resold it to a very famous Major League Baseball player who made hundreds of millions of dollars. And I just couldn't compete with my $100,000 of debt and $2,000 budget. Mm -hmm. I tried to get it. This is in roughly 1996. I found out who had bought it. I knew he was about to sell it or had just sold it. And I came up with a bunch of stuff I just purchased, including a Buck Weaver bat, for example. And I said, look, this is probably like ten dollars or $15,000 of objects. 
and I'll trade them all to you for this ball because I really want, this is important to what I'm trying to build. And the dealer looked at it and said, these are all impressive items, but I'd rather just have $10,000 cash. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm sorry, and I can't do this for you. Mm -hmm. And I waited for 25 years for another chance of that. Did you remind the dealer that he could sell the items that you were trading him? Oh, I tried everything. <laughs> I tried everything. He was like, it's just too hard. Like, you know, yeah. the Weaver bat's 3000 and this is 2000 and this is 1500 It's just too much work, uh-huh. you know? Like, and I don't blame him. I mean, he made the right choice for him. Mm-hmm. But I went on and purchased virtually every example known of a baseball made where there's a change in the design from the 1840s to the present. But I always knew that I was missing the first patent. It was like this gaping hole in what I was trying to achieve. And any time I would show my collection to someone, they would applaud what I'd done, and they couldn't believe what I'd done. But I knew in my own mind what was missing, Mm -hmm. and it ate at me in a way that I really can't describe adequately. I knew what was missing, and it would never be whole until I had it. Mm -hmm. And then in the last year, it came up for auction at a well-respected auction house in Texas, from the same seller, the same Major League Baseball player, David Wells. And David Wells, in this case, was a consigner. I'd reached out to him on Twitter, and he had not responded. And I just thought, well, if it went for $10,000 in 1996 or whatever it was, then 2021, it's going to go for fifty. Mm-hmm. And I really don't want to spend that either, and I'm going to miss out again. Yeah. And it went for, I think, like five or 6000 It went for less than it did in the early 90s. And when I got it, I was just so elated. There's not a lot of things you wait around for for 25 years. And then get a bargain on. Right. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, thank God. Yeah. I collect vinyl records. And um, before you press 10,000 copies of a record, they have what's called test pressings. To press a record, you basically make a jello mold of each side, the A side and the B side. You press them together. They'll make four or five test pressings to make sure that the jello molds are printing correctly. And then once those are approved and everything sounds good, then they go ahead with the full pressing. So those test pressings are very hard to come by if they even are released to the public. A lot of times the major labels don't ever release them. But yeah, that's what I like to collect. Exactly. Uh, test pressings of one particular band, but in general. I remember also. you having a, every single example of that band? Yeah. Yeah. I have the world's biggest collection of this band, Alkaline Trio. And there's a couple people who think that they have the most complete collection. Nobody has a complete, complete collection, but they... Not even the members of the band. Definitely not them. (laughs) I have a way more complete collection than anybody in the band, like hands down. I love that. Yeah, it's not even close. But I've never posted a list of everything I have in my collection online because when there's only four or five or like, let's say 10 people in the world who are going after the things you're going after, if you're all missing one piece, but it's the only piece you're missing... Well, Collector 2, if that same piece comes up, he knows you're going to go after it so hard because it's your last piece. So I've always been very secretive about what's exactly in my collection. Right. Those other people don't play that game, which is why they don't have the nicest collection in the world, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> but yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. They're like, when I show people my Alkaline Trio collection, they're like, oh my God, it's inc- you've been doing this for 20 years. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm missing that one record. And right. it, it doesn't feel complete. And they're still an active band, so they're still putting out records. But I don't care. I mean, I still do buy them. But if I stopped, I would still consider my collection complete if I got that one thing and then didn't continue on. And I know that that's how it must have felt with you. That like Major League Baseball is still going to make changes to the baseball over time. But if you never bought another one of those, your collection would still be, in your mind, complete because you had the one. Exactly. And there there have been other examples like that. I won't go into too much detail about this, but there were two of the most famous Conlon images ever are the extreme close-ups of Ruth and Gehrig in 1927 by Charles Conlon. And I had already owned the cover image, which was the Walsh spitball grip of 1913. The back of the McKay book was Babe Ruth's extreme close-up, what some people call Ruth's eyes. Mm -hmm. And Ruth and Gehrig's eyes came up in 1998 at auction. And once again, I was the underbidder. But it turned out the winning bidder was the owner of the auction house, which was legal under certain circumstances if certain disclosures were made. But in this case, certain disclosures were not made. Mm. And this particular auctioneer wound up in federal prison, not for this particular reason, but for related reasons. And I called him after the auction. I said, I understand you were the winner. And I won't quote him exactly because this is a family show, I assume. But he said, it's my auction and I can do what I want. And 
legally that was not true. <laughs> so we negotiated a deal where he would sell me the images for about twice what he paid, which wound up being about 25000 for the pair, which is a lot of money. Mm-hmm. But I think they've appreciated to the point where I've done really well with them. Yeah. And I, I think I've purchased about 2,000 objects as a collector. I've probably made real money on less than half a dozen, and those are two of the half dozen. <laughs> I probably lost money on close to 2000 and it'll be more than made up for by those two images. Yeah, those are two good ones to have. That's your uh, park place and boardwalk. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You can lose money is. on Marvin Gardens. And there, there's possibly, with any photograph, you can never say it's the only one known because photographs are meant to be made in quantity. Mm-hmm. But the only two that ever appeared at auction, they're the only two that I'm aware of. They're Colin's most recognizable work. They're in good condition. They're Colin's stamps on the back. And they're of... Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and, 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 and 1927. <laughs> Highly collectible. It doesn't get better than 1927. And I you know, wanted to display them with the Ruth and Gehrig bats and the bats of the whole lineup. And it's another theme that I've devoted myself to. It took me many, many years to get all those bats. Yeah. I mean, the Ruth and Gehrigs are the easy ones. It's the Ben Pascal who pinch hit for Ruth. Trying to get a Ben Pascal bat is one known. I now have it. Until that surface, there was none. Yeah. So... To me, the Pascal bat is better than the Ruth and Gehrig bat. Yeah, because there are dozens of Ruth and Gehrig. So it's not like you don't appreciate them because it's still a Babe Ruth bat. But if you lost that one, you could go find another one. Right. Money so, can't buy another. Exactly. Yeah. If I gave you $10 million and said, put together a collection of 27 Yankee bats, game used, all used possibly during the 27 season. Mm-hmm. If I gave you $10 million, it would take you maybe a few weeks to service a Ruth and Gehrig. You could spend the next 25 years, you're not getting a Ben Pascal bat for $10 million unless I sell it to you. Right. And that's just the way it is. Yeah. So what were the early days like for photography collectors? Because at one point, or at many points, people just kind of thought about these photos in the same way that they thought about their baseball cards before the boom. It's just stuff that's not worth anything. It's not an investment. But watching that change and seeing them become more than just stuff that was used by newspapers, seeing them become art, seeing them take their place in the world as art, how has that changed collecting? Well, in a way, it was heaven. Because when no one appreciates what you appreciate, the world is your oyster, and you can acquire anything you want to acquire, and it's reasonable, and it's fantastic. So a lot of people say to me, your objects have appreciated tenfold. That's fantastic. I think that's awful. Because now, if I want to acquire something new, it's ten times what I wanted right. to pay last time. Right, right. I don't understand why they're celebrating that. I think it's awful. hmm if you're eating hamburger every day for dinner, you don't want the price of hamburger to go up. You want it to go down. Mm-hmm. Actually, anything I collect, I want the price to go down. Mm-hmm. When I want to sell it, that's when I want inflation. Mm-hmm. But that's not what I want right now. So lately, there's been tremendous increase in prices. But it's interesting. It tends to be more for extremely commercial pieces. It tends to be more for Ruth and Gehrig. It tends to be more for images that were used on baseball cards. And you can still get phenomenal images mm-hmm. for nothing. Is that bubble going to burst? Or is this, since there's only so select few things that are increasing like crazy, there really is always going to be a market for a Babe Ruth 1927? So the, the one thing I learned as an investor is when there's a bubble, you never know when it's going to burst. It always will. Mm-hmm. But it can increase tenfold before that happens, and you'll be wrong the whole way. Mm-hmm. In stock investing, for example, you should never sell something short, which is to bet it that it's going to go down just because it's overvalued, because it can just continue to go up much longer than you can stay solvent. I think that's a little bit the case with baseball images, that some of the more popular images are truly ridiculous prices. Yeah. And, and the way I measure that is not so much on an absolute basis that a Jackie Robinson photograph is selling for $50,000. It's the relative basis of what that same image would go for in the photography market, mm. what a major museum would pay for that image. They might pay $1,000 for an image that's going for 50000 at auction in the baseball market. Mm-hmm. I always assumed when I first started collecting that one day the baseball market and the photography market would converge. And because the photography market was so much more sophisticated, that it was really the photography market's valuations that would will out and the baseball market's valuations would be subsumed in that. Mm -hmm. That has been a terribly wrong judgment and has cost me incredible amounts of money. (laughs) And I could have retired many times over if I had the opposite view Mm -hmm. early on. And if anything, the two markets are further apart than they've ever been, and there's no sign that that's going to change at all. (laughs) And um, I regret a lot of the decisions I made. I could have had anything at very, very attractive prices, and I passed Mm -hmm. because I didn't see the 
the merit in it from a photography perspective, but from a baseball market perspective, it has unbelievable importance to some collectors. Mm -hmm. And I just realize I'm just not capable of making that judgment correctly. I mean, it's just Murphy's Law, right? I mean, if you would have bought them all, then it wouldn't have happened. And right, you'd be sitting exactly. here with 50,000 images. You're like, ah, nobody wants this. That's life, isn't it? It is. But people do collect these photos and the negatives and the contact prints. Have the cameras themselves ever come up for auction? Like, I feel like that would be a pretty incredible piece in somebody's collection if they were like, yeah, I've got Charles Conlon's camera. <laughs> oh, boy. What a story. Someone approached me, someone I trust implicitly, someone who's always protected me in the baseball market, and said he had a contact in the baseball market who had Conlon's two cameras. And I said, you know, I'm looking at potentially doing a museum show one day. To have Conlon's cameras would be a tremendous display for that museum show. And I'll basically pay whatever it takes to get them. And the person who said he had them had a very reasonable story as to how he obtained them. He was partners with someone who acquired the Sporting News Archives. The Sporting News Archives included all of Conlon's negatives and all of his prints that he owned at the end of his life. And it made perfect sense that he would also have his cameras at that point. And there was even a newspaper article they forwarded to me that talked about the two cameras. And I said, whatever you want, I'll pay. And... I bought them, and then a few weeks later, I got a call from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the FBI said, I want you to know that the cameras you just purchased are not authentic, and we're going to confiscate them. We're going to use them as evidence in a criminal lawsuit against the person who sold them to you, and then we're going to destroy them. So even though they actually have some modest value as cameras, you won't even get that. You're going to have a complete loss. And forget whether they were his or not. If they were similar to what he used, it's still cool to display. You sure. could still be like, yeah, this is what he would have used. So it stinks that you didn't even have that. It was a heavy loss. Yeah. And it also makes you feel stupid. But it, there's no way to protect that. If it's somebody that you trust and they have a plausible story, that's not on you. That's on them. Right. You know. So, yeah, you can't look at it that way. There's only so many people's word who you take. And if one of those people betrays you, then... Right. Well, in this case, the person who introduced the owner of the cameras to me is, did not betray me. He himself was taken in by this mm-hmm. con artist. But just, you know, anytime you're dealing in objects, so objects always rely on information asymmetry. Mm-hmm. So when I'm buying a baseball bat from someone, I know something about the baseball bat that they don't, or it's just going to occur at market. But if I want to bargain, I recognize something about that bat that they don't recognize. Mm-hmm. I bought a $35 photograph of Big Ed Walsh's spitter. The person had no idea what he had, Mm -hmm. which is information asymmetry. I looked at it, I knew right away this is at least a $350 image. I would pay $35,000 for it today, but then let's say it was $350, and you think it's $35, there's this informational asymmetry. Mm -hmm. Whenever you have this asymmetry of information, it's a little dirty. There's something not ethical about having more information than your counterparty. It's just something not right about it. I mean, it happens in the stock market, for example. I mean, if you do more homework, you should be rewarded for doing that homework. But there's something in, in, the, in the world of objects that is a little more unseemly just because some, that same information isn't available to everyone. So mm-hmm. like, if I want to analyze a stock, all the information you need is publicly available. It's contained in the filings of an SEC report. But that same disclosure doesn't exist in objects. Mm-hmm. That's an intriguing concept. During a cleaning phase halfway through his career, Conlon destroyed and discarded what is believed to be thousands of negatives. Why did he do that? Because they were glass and taking up a lot of room. He lived in a small house in New Jersey and just didn't have the room. How many of his images survived? About 8,000 of potentially forty to 50,000 total. Ugh. Of the ones which did survive, what percentage were glass plate negatives and what percentage were film? Because he didn't only shoot glass plate negatives. Great question. I don't know the answer because I I never saw the original collection. I believe he used glass until the late 30s, Mm -hmm. but I really don't know. And when he went through that cleaning process, do you think he went through and was like, you know what, I'm keeping this one, this is a great photo, or was he just like, anything before this date is garbage, I'm starting fresh? I don't know for sure, but... One of the things that strikes me when I look at the McCabe books is how much the McCabe books tilt towards later images. Mm -hmm. There just isn't a lot of 1911, 12, 13, 14, 15 negatives in those books. So do you think that he didn't think he was a great photographer yet? Well, that's that's another question. So the really interesting thing for me about Conlon is that he 
some people regard him as a folk artist. I actually displayed some of my Conlon images at the American Museum of Folk Art. And Neil McCabe, who's like this constant voice in my ear as a collector and as the author of the book that kind of set me on this journey, wrote a letter to the curator of the American Folk Art Museum and said, thank you so much for including Conlon as a folk artist. I think that's exactly the right way to see him. I think that's right. I'm not entirely convinced it's right because Conlon was very much aware of the world of artistic photography. Mm -hmm. He's very much aware of people like Stieglitz and Steichen. And he entered some photography contests circa 1913, 1914, where bizarrely, when he's taking the most compelling images of his entire career, he's taking portraits that will just knock the curators of the top museums in America on their butts. Like when they look at these images, they can't believe how strong these images are. He's not entering those images into the contest. He's entering images he took of bears, presumably at the Bronx Zoo. Was he winning those contests? No. <laughs> and I just don't understand how he wasn't aware of his own talent in a way. Mm hmm I mean, he was incredibly talented. Do you think by the end of his life and career that he was aware? Or? No, because even, I think it was 1917, he wrote an article saying the greatest image he ever took was Ty Cobb sliding into Jimmy Austin. Mm -hmm. It's a great image. It's a good action shot. One of the interesting things is that he wasn't aware that he had taken it until he got home. Right. He says he took it out of instinct. And one of the interesting things about this is that the artist Chuck Close, who's a great portrait artist, has said that photography is the only medium in which it is possible to make an accidental masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And I think the Cobb image of sliding into Jimmy Austin is an example of that accidental masterpiece. Contrasted to that action image is an entire collection of incredible portraits, which I think is 10 times the Conlon image, but he didn't pick those. Mm -hmm. And who am I to tell Conlon what his best image is? I mean, if he thinks his best image is Ty Cobb, Maybe it's Ty Cobb. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I can't be that arrogant. But, I mean, to compare his portraits of Hannes Wagner and Chief Myers and Christy Mathis in 1911, I just think those are towering over the Cobb. There's also a difference between the word best and the word favorite, right? I mean, maybe that's what he meant, that the Cobb was his that's favorite true. and not necessarily his best. I'd have to go back to the article to see exactly what his language was. Mm -hmm. But I think his contemporaries responded most to the Cobb image because it was so rare to see action images at that point that were so good, mm -hmm. because of the limitations of the Graflex yeah. and other things. In that Cobb image, you can literally see the dirt exactly. flying up. Like, that wasn't common in photography Right, and the, the dirt flying says so much about Cobb's fierceness and his competitiveness. It's a symbol of everything you want to think about Cobb. It's really a fantastic action image. But if I had to own a vintage print of that, which now sells for north of a quarter of a million dollars, or my portrait that he took of Chief Myers in 1914, which probably sells for like 5000 I would take Myers every day of the week. Mm -hmm. At your collection's peak, how many Conlon images did you own? At least 500, all of which I've given to the Met, except for two, which are the Ruth and Garrick extreme close-ups. How did you not run into the same problem that Conlon himself ran into when it came to storing them all? <laughs> where, where did you keep them? And how did you keep them safe? Yeah, I mean, I had a relatively large home, one room of which, well, more than one room of which, multiple rooms of which was devoted to my baseball collection, one in particular. Of course, it had to be humidity controlled and temperature controlled and everything like that. It had to be all archivally stored. There's an archival company that I rely on in Brooklyn and a framing company that I rely on in Brooklyn to keep everything safe and hidden from ultraviolet light and from changes in humidity. I mean, I always felt like I owned a certain duty to Americans to preserve what I had and to keep it in good condition and to the extent it needed conservation to pay for the conservation. And I had a friend who was the owner of a framing shop who was very much involved with conservation also. Mm -hmm. And he pointed out that when you take it upon yourself to preserve America's heritage for America, it's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, it was expensive in a way that I couldn't afford even. Mm -hmm. But I just had this calling. Yeah. When it comes to the rights for the images themselves, how does that work? Like if you own the negative, do you own the image? No, you don't. Well, it depends how the negative is sold because the artist can sell the negative with the rights or the artist can sell the negative without the rights. Mm -hmm. 
In this particular case, I don't think Conlon ever stated you know, what was happening with the rights per se. I don't think there's an agreement between him and the Sporting News bestowing the rights on the Sporting News, for example. How did the Sporting News come into possession of his archives? As far as I know, no one really knows. It's just a sale late in his life, either in the late 1930s or the early 1940s. There's no documentation that mm. I'm aware of. There's no agreement between Conlon and the Sporting News outlining exactly the contents of the deal. Mm-hmm. So let's assume that he did grant them the rights to all the images. And then the Sporting News sold them to whoever buys them. And in this instance, it was you. So would the rights have then transferred to you? Like, theoretically, would you have owned them in that instance? It's a question I'm going to leave for lawyers to answer. Yeah. I, I'm just not an authority enough. Yeah, me either. We always talk about how athletes have primes. You know, their entire careers might be 10 years or 15 years, 20 if they're incredibly lucky. But their prime might only last three years or five years or seven if they're a superstar. Do photographers have their primes too? Because I would think that there's a graph with two lines being measured across the x-axis as time progresses, where one line measures knowledge, skill, technique, those things, and one measures reflexes and physical ability. So am I onto something here? You're very much onto something, and I'm going to rely on something that I read first by a photographer who was the curator for MoMA. He believed that photographers had roughly a five-year period when they were at their peak after which and before which they were good, but not the same. And I think if you look at Conlon, you could see the exact same arc. So I think Conlon, from when he started in 1904 to 1910, was just an also-ran photographer whose work was largely indistinguishable from everybody else. In 1911, he realizes that the Spalding Guide, which is his principal employer, needs portraits, and that they're using portraits taken by the American Tobacco Company for the T205 baseball card set. And those portraits are extraordinarily compelling. They're fantastic. They're unlike almost anything you'll see in American photography beforehand, even though they're taken by, I don't know, maybe half a dozen different photographers or more. And Conlon is all but shut out of that issue of the Spalding Guide. It's all Paul Thompson Agency's work. Mm. And I think someone like John Foster told him, if you want to be in here next year, we need portraits from you. That's where we're going. Before we get to when his work changed... All those portraits were taken by multiple photographers. Have the memos surfaced from the Thompson agency that was like no, telling wish. the photographers, this is what I need you to do? Like That would be nirvana. Yeah, that seems like it would be... A, There's nothing that exists from back then. Something like that must have existed at one point, right? Sure. For the consistency to have been the way it was. Sure. I mean, I've tried in certain respects to find those missing links. So, mm-hmm. for example... There's a tremendous turning point in the history of sports photography in 1920 when all of a sudden newspapers start photographing every play of a game. Mm-hmm. And before that, like if you look at the entire history of baseball from 1869 to 1919, it's 50 years. During those 50 years, not one single important moment in the history of the game is captured on film. After that moment, every single important moment in the history of baseball is captured on film. And you kind of break down baseball photography into two eras, before Ray Chapman's death and after. Mm -hmm. Why is that the distinction point for you? Well, I think you can draw a line down baseball history. There's before Chapman and after Chapman. From 1869 to 1919, there are no great images captured of important moments. So Hoss Radborn wins his 60th in 1884 or 59, depending on how you're revising the statistics of the time. There's no image. 1870, the Red Stockings lose to the Atlantics. There's no image. You can name whatever great moment you want in the 19th century. I can assure you there is no image. Then you can go into the 20th century, the Merkel play. There's no image. Snodgrass's muff in the 1912 World Series. There's no image. Shoeless Joe Jackson doing anything of importance in the 1919 World Series. There's no image. Eddie Seacott hitting the first batter in the 1919 World Series. In the first batter, how could there be no image? Right. I mean, there's nothing. Yeah. And it's not like they were there and then they left. I mean, it's the first batter. How of can the you, first how you, game, <laughs> right. How do you not get that image? <laughs> right. There's nothing. And then if I ask you after 1920 to name any important moment that's not captured, you can't do it. They're all captured. Mm-hmm. I mean, the one possible exception is Ruth pointing to the outfield for his home run, but it may never have actually happened. And there's video of it. <laughs> and there's video of it. But like, yeah. but it's ambiguous to what he's doing. But right. like... But no one but knows. But it was that, captured, though. Right. But no. Point, right. Yeah. But no one knows that he pointed and called the home run. Yeah. So you can't capture something you didn't know happened. Mm-hmm. But the moment that changed was the 1920 World Series, and I actually think if you work back a few weeks to Ray Chapman's beaning in August of 1920, here's a man killed on a baseball field in New York 
in the summer <laughs> in a full stadium in a pennant race in a pennant race and there's no image not only is there not an image of his dying there's no image of him laying on the ground there's no image of him being carried to the outfield by his best friends Smokey Joe Wood and Tris Speaker who were like the best men at his wedding there's no image of the umpire yelling to the stands is there a doctor in the house there are so many possible compelling images I mean, just the image of the umpire yelling with that stricken look on his face would be one of the greatest images in the history of the sport. Mm -hmm. doesn't exist. Well, in June 1919, the Daily News became the first picture newspaper in the United States. And they ultimately hired a large staff of in-house photographers and for the 1920 World Series decided to station a photographer on first base and third base in the stands and take a picture of every single play. And to do so with a retrofitted Graflex, we've spoken about the Graflex before, but they actually modified the Graflex so that it would be like a reconnaissance camera in World War I, which is what this one photographer named Marlboro Lou Walker, mm -hmm. who was on either on the first base or the third base side, I'm not sure. He extended the bellows to basically make his Graflex a long-distance camera, if you will, and captured the first unassisted triple play in the history of the World Series. But he captured every play, and mm -hmm. it just so happened that one of them was the unassisted triple play. If you hadn't set out to capture every play, you wouldn't have gotten that one play. Right. So in a way, that moment was the moment that American News decided that as a way to inform their readers, they had to pursue what I'd call Sports Illustrated. And this is 34 years before the magazine. Mm -hmm. But they had to illustrate every play so that you felt like you were at the stadium. And then ultimately in 1954, when Sports Illustrated came along, the idea was not that they were going to illustrate every play, because the technology has progressed, we can now put you in the play. You're going to be on the field. Mm -hmm. We're going to use a camera. You're going to see Jackie Robinson sliding into home plate, and you're going to feel like you're the third base coach. You're there. Mm -hmm. That old phrase, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Right. That's kind of the attitude that editors took is like, let's just photograph everything. And if nothing good happens, then we don't need to use it. But if something like the first unassisted triple play in the history of baseball happens... We've got it. Right. The first use, that 1920 World Series, was that they were going to illustrate every important play, what was called a double truck, which was a two-page spread in the newspaper of every important play, mm -hmm. so that you would feel like you could relive the whole game while mm -hmm. you were reading this newspaper on the subway, Yeah. which is where it was meant to be read. Mm -hmm. When Conlon does enter his prime then, it's because he decides he needs to be a part of the Spalding catalog? That's what I believe. How did he all of a sudden just flip that switch and was like, all right, I'm going to be great now? I'm not sure he thought that as much as he already had. So he'd been at it for seven years, mm -hmm. possibly as early as 1905, had Christy Matheson telling all the subjects, trust Charlie always. Mm -hmm. And then 1911, when he decides to be or decides he has to be a portrait photographer to keep his standing at the spoiling guide. He has the relationships to make it work and all of a sudden starts taking what I believe are some of the most compelling portraits in the history of baseball photography. And his image of Christy Mathieson in 1911 with his hands on his hips, to me, is one of the half dozen great portraits in the history of the sport. It's possibly the first portrait he ever took. We'll never know exactly. I've found two other 1911 Giants portraits that are somewhat similar. Mm. They're not the same quality as Mathieson. But it would make sense when he went to portraiture that he would experiment first on the people he was closest to, which are the Giants. Yeah. And the 1911 Matheson that I bought, there was an auction at Hunt Auctions that included a scrapbook that belonged to Philadelphia A's member Amos Strunk. And it included the Matheson and it was all glued into pages. And people didn't want to own it because it was glued in. And I just thought, it's a contact print of Matheson. Yeah. It is the only one known. You fools. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just buy it. Pay for a conservator to take it off the paper, and you will have a treasure that no one else has. And that's, that's you know, that, that the rest is history for my collection. Incredible. In your mind, what years do you consider Charles Conlon's prime to be? How long did his prime last? Yeah, roughly 1911 to 1916. I can stretch it into 1917, 1918. When he first starts taking portraits, he's so good, even in 1911. And then... 1912, he's very good. 1913, 1914, I think are the absolute peaks. That's when he starts experimenting with these various photographic essays of eyes and hands and grips. He does that for the first time in 1314. He's using 5 by 7 negatives, which he stops using shortly thereafter. Again, these images have tremendous amounts of information on them. I happen to like just the 
aesthetics of a 5 by 7 print. It's very close to a Fibonacci ratio mm -hmm. compared to the other potential sizes. I just love them. Yeah. The interesting thing about the prime of an action photographer compared to like, let's say he had never gone into sports and he just continued to be a landscape photographer. Those primes can last longer, I think, because beauty is beauty. But to be able to capture a fleeting moment, your reflexes need to be on point. You need to be agile enough to be positioned in places where you can get that shot. Right. Like that's what makes Neil Leifer such an incredible photographer that for 50 years, this guy's been the best sports photographer there is. Right. But also he had a couple of key relationships. Ali, for example. Yeah. So if Ali, Ali helps was you, his if, Christy Matthews. Right. If Ali helps you get famous, it's a, it's a good person. I knew Neil Leifer well. We were kind of partners together in a venture with Sports Illustrated many, many years ago that I did with a friend where he was kind of on the board of advisors. Part of it is Conlon was a portrait photographer. So you have to think about when your relationships with your subjects are at their peak. So circa 1918, you have people who are Conlon's closest relationships. McGraw, Matthewson, Wagner. are all starting to leave the game. Mm -hmm. But when you lose those key relationships, it has an impact on your ability to perform. And I think that's one reason why you stop seeing Conlon at his absolute best circa 1918, 1919. That's one mm -hmm. reason. Two is that once you have people like the Daily News with these large photographic staffs, all of a sudden, Colin's competing for attention. And there's a story where he went up to Hannes Wagner to take his picture, and Wagner said, I'm not going to let you take my picture. Beat it. And Colin said he was hurt by this because he considered Wagner a close friend. And he went up to Wagner later, and Wagner said, I didn't let you take that picture because some other photographer was trying to get in on it, and I'm your friend, and I didn't want that to happen. I just wanted it to be your image. But that other photographer is someone who would have been there once the Daily News was there. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, that's part of the subjects reacting to you. You're their friend, but you're standing next to someone who's almost paparazzi to them. And it's not the same. They're mm -hmm. not themselves anymore. Yeah, that's interesting. I know Conlon said that the Cobb slide was his greatest photograph to that point, but did he ever talk about which one was his favorite? Do you remember ever having him make that distinction? Or should we assume that that one was his favorite as well? As I think that, he that's the one he was proudest of. Yeah. He had an interview late in life, 1937, with the sporting news where he discussed some other images. There was a, an image he took of Three Finger Brown's hand. Mm -hmm. Three Finger Brown, for those who don't know, was one of the great pitchers of all time, a major competitor of Christy Matthewson's, who played for the Chicago Cubs and who was called Three Finger Brown because he had lost a significant portion of his hand to farm equipment. I've heard it said it's a corn shredder. I don't know if that's true. But I believe he had three and a half fingers remaining. And that three and a half finger grip imparted a special curve to his pitches that other people didn't have and made him a great pitcher. And in 1914, when Brown signed with the Federal League, Conlon took a picture of his hand holding a baseball and thought, boy, this is going to be interesting for John McGraw because he's always wanted to know what Brown could do and why. And I'm going to give this to John McGraw as a favor. And I don't know if what, if anything, McGraw could possibly learn from this image, but he mentioned this in the 1937 interview that this was an image that stuck out in his mind as one of his more significant images. But it goes back to a question you asked before about trust, where, you know, if I were Three Finger Brown, I wouldn't really want this shared with my chief rival in baseball. Right. And... I think Conlon was smart enough to know that, which is why that discussion never took place until 1937. Right. You know, he would have never given that same interview in 1917. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The backs of Conlon's prints are sometimes stamped with two different addresses. One is his 111th Street address, and one is 189 Alden Place. What do we know about those addresses, and what time frame prints from each of those addresses would be from? So to get to the exact dates, I'd need to refer to notes, but I can tell you roughly that... The 111th Street address is roughly 1909-ish, could be a little later. And the 189 Alton Place prints are at least 1930 to 1943, and possibly earlier than 1930. We only know these dates. They're actually not. I've looked at census records. I've looked at city directories to try to find out exactly when these were used. But there's an image of Conlon at his proofreader's desk at the Evening Telegram, dated 1930, where his 189 Alden Place address is visible in the image. And that's the only reason I know that it's that early. Mm -hmm. See, so that's some real detective work there. <laughs> you know, the fact that you're going through census records and like, you're not just some guy with deep pockets who wants to buy every picture. He Like, you care about 
the why and yeah. the how. When I'm reacting to a photograph, I want to understand why it's doing what it's doing to me. It's almost in a way, if you're in love with someone, why are you in love with them? Mm -hmm. They're a kind person, they're beautiful, they're handsome, whatever it is. But there's a mystery about it. Mm -hmm. But with something like this, is a way to try to fill in that mystery and try to understand what am I seeing. You've said that there's two kinds of photographs, those that provide answers and those that ask questions. What do you mean by that? And what are some examples of photos which provide answers? To me, the best photographs are ones that ask questions, particularly open-ended questions. The best example I can give of one that provides answers would be Nat Fine's image of Babe Ruth on June 13, 1948, at his farewell. And I would say that I knew Nat Fine pretty well. I spent two pretty full days with him back in the 1990s. I really liked him. He was a wonderful man. He had a great sense of humor, a little dirty, but just a fantastic person to get to know. His image of Babe Ruth tells you all you need to know about what's happening on that date in seconds. It's got all the answers. This is Babe Ruth's farewell. In my mind, this is apotheosis. It's the moment that Ruth, if you will, kind of ascends to heaven and becomes a god. Versus other images that I own where I look at them for 25 years and I think, what's going on in this image? Like, there's something compelling. I don't know what it is. I can't even scratch the surface of the questions it's asking. Those, to me, are better images, and the analogy in painting would be a Rembrandt portrait and a Norman Rockwell. I mean, obviously, everyone would say right away that a Rembrandt is superior to a Rockwell, but a Rockwell succeeds in what it tries to do, which is to give you all the answers at once. That's what illustration is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. That is a great illustrator. So Norman Rockwell, because he gives you all the answers, is succeeding at precisely what his problem is. In a way, some photographers seek to do what Rockwell does, and give you everything you need to know in a second, I think those images are lesser, even to the extent that some like Fine's image, for example, is the only baseball photograph ever to be honored with a Pulitzer. Mm -hmm. So it's not a bad image, but it tells you what you need to know right away. Mm -hmm. it, there's no mystery. I wrote an essay once, the opening sentence of which was, some photographs tell stories, others keep secrets. And I'm very proud of that sentence, but I also love an image that is reticent. I love an image that doesn't tell you that you're never going to know everything you want to know. There's a concept in photography called the decisive moment. What does that mean? And tell us how two different photographers learned about that on the day of Babe Ruth's farewell. So the decisive moment is a phrase that comes from a French photographer named Henri Cartier-Bresson. And by that he meant the decisive moment is not the moment the bat meets the ball and you have action. The decisive moment is when you're looking through a viewfinder and all of the aspects of the image, the composition and the lighting and everything comes together so that when you look at it, it's a photograph even before you press the shutter. You're looking through the viewfinder and you're thinking, I have to click right now because that's exactly what I want to capture. That is a decisive moment. If you look at June 13, 1948, when that fine was at Ruth's farewell, Many people thought the decisive moment was when Ed Barrow came across the field to hug Babe Ruth, and they hugged and they swayed for a minute, and it was a moment when these two men who had actually had some serious differences in life decided to bury the hatchet because Ruth was dying. It put a lump in everyone's throat, and for the newspaper writers, that was the decisive moment. But for the photographers, the decisive moment was getting behind Ruth, photographing him with the number three visible, and showing that moment when he was no longer going to be part of the game, and when he would really kind of have his moment of apotheosis, if you will. And there were two photographers who captured that. One was Nat Fine, who we've talked about. The other one was the man standing next to him named Harry Harris, who was photographing for the Associated Press. Nat Fine, I believe, shot second. I believe Harry Harris shot like a split second before. And if you look at newsreels of that moment, you can actually see the moment when Harry Harris's flash goes off. And his big mistake is to use a flash. Nat Fine remembered at that moment, this is coming from a conversation I had with Nat Fine when I went to see him in his house. I believe it was Jimmy Hare, but possibly someone else who taught him that when you take a picture, never use a flash, ever. Instead, because it was a cloudy day, and you can see that in the photograph, you have to open the aperture to let in more light. When you open the aperture and let in more light, you're making a trade-off. The image is not going to be as sharp. What's in the center of the image, Ruth, will remain sharp. But all the background, the banners, the Yankee Stadium, are going to be less sharp. So the eye will move from the cold center, which is sharp, 
to the kind of warm, less sharp images throughout the image. You never use a flash. You should disable the flash on your iPhone. It will ruin every picture you ever take. It causes whatever you're shooting to be rooted in its place. And to me, that makes all the difference. And to the people at the time who saw those two images, Harry Harris shot the image in portrait, if you will. Nat Fine shot it in landscape. They're not really comparable. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't the decisive moment the way a journalist would look at it. Again, that was Barrow and Ruth hugging. It was the decisive moment from the perspective of Harry Harris and Nat Fine shooting the precise moment that people wanted to remember Ruth by. But there's another way to look at the decisive moment that really no one's thought about. I've tried to write about. I can't get it to a point where I'm proud enough of it to publish it, Mm -hmm. but I'm struggling with it. And that is that no one thinks about the decisive moment behind the camera. Mm -hmm. They always think about the decisive moment what's happening in front of the lens. But for Nat Fine and Harry Harris, that was about a decisive moment in their lives that you could ever get. So I spoke to Nat Fine. And don't get me wrong, he was very happy to have won the Pulitzer Prize. It kind of made him a modest celebrity. It kind of gave him currency to talk to almost anyone he would ever meet for the rest of his life. But he said he found it a little more difficult at work after he won the Pulitzer Prize, that his editors were always looking for the next great Pulitzer, and that image never came. And then people always bugging him. I mean, I try to be respectful when I reach out to people like this and go to visit them, but not everyone is, Mm -hmm. you know. He said to me, you know, you take one picture... People never leave you alone. And he meant that in a very bitter way. And I really felt bad. And I I kind of hoped at the time that I wasn't adding to that Mm -hmm. burden. Then I met Harry Harris. Talk about bitter. Oh, my God. I mean, he was ruined as a person because he wasn't even nominated for the Pulitzer Prize, (laughs) which he couldn't even comprehend because his image was almost indistinguishable from that find. Mm -hmm. And he told a story that he was sitting next to Fine and told Fine what to shoot which is impossible to even imagine because, Mm -hmm. I mean, Fine was an established photographer at that point, not a baseball photographer, but a human interest photographer who had been successful. I can't imagine him looking at the guy next to him and going like, well, should I shoot this? Like, you think this is a good idea? No, I mean, he was a good photographer. Yeah, it's Um, it's okay, Neil Armstrong. You go ahead. You you take the first steps. (laughs) Exactly, (laughs) exactly. But, I mean, Harry Harris just could not live with that decisive moment and the impact that it had on his life. I met him at a New York Press Photographers Association meeting, and that's all he could talk about was Nat Fine. And then he brought up Arthur Felig, who's known as Ouija. Ouija was the one who traveled with a police radio who had reinvented crime photography and took unbelievable images. No one did spot news like Ouija, and no one ever will. And he said, you know, I knew Ouija. And I looked at Harry Harris, and I thought, you knew Ouija? That's incredible. I mean, they worked together. Mm-hmm. And he said, he was just a regular photographer like the rest of us. And all I could think of was, no, he was not. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, some people just have that chip in their brain that tells them to do something differently. Right. You know, did Ouija have access to anything that nobody else had access to? No. no he just utilized that access differently right. than anybody but else. But when other people took photographs of a fire, they pointed the camera to the building. Mm-hmm. Ouija pointed the camera to the families of the victims. Mm. It is a very different image. Mm-hmm. It is like something, once you see an image of a mother watching her children burn to death, you'll never forget that image. Yeah, There's no image like that in Harry Harris's portfolio, and mm-hmm. never will be. Mm-hmm. What about some photos that ask questions? Like, tell me about one particular photo of a guy named Javon Emery. Who was he? It's one of the first photographs I ever bought. It was actually a glass plate negative, five by seven, containing a ton of information. And... I bought it without ever seeing it. It's the only image I ever bought without seeing. I didn't even see a thumbnail or anything. I read a description of about half a dozen words that said something like Negro League Catcher circa 1890. And it was $500, if I remember correctly. And I just thought, if I don't buy this right now, if I called him and asked him for a Xerox in the mail, someone else is going to buy it. And I have to buy it right now or I'm going to miss it. So I bought it, and when it came... I couldn't believe how good it was. I couldn't believe my good fortune. I just got lucky. But there was something about it. Going back to this theme of trying to understand why things are compelling to me, this image was so compelling to me, and I had no idea why. I had it on the wall of my office for multiple years. Maybe five years after looking at it every day next to my office, it occurred to me the reason this was compelling was that it was likely a white photographer looking at a black man in the 1880s 
as if he were a hero. And I thought, that's unusual. Mm -hmm. I need to get at this. I was told it was acquired near Philadelphia. So I would go to like New York Public Library and look at microfiche and rolls of film, uh, old newspapers in the Philadelphia area trying to look for someone named Van Emery, which is what was written on the negative. And there's a lot written on old Negro League players and things, or black baseball before the Negro Leagues, but no one named Van Emery. The name doesn't appear. So I did that for a while, and I just gave up until digitization of newspapers became possible. And then I thought, maybe I'll take another stab at this. This is much easier to search. Mm -hmm. So I searched for Van Emery as a last name, and I found someone named Emery in the Philadelphia area who played baseball. And then I went to his census records, and he had a brother named Javan. And I thought, this could be the guy. And did more work and more work. I ultimately put about 500 hours of research into this image. And became absolutely convinced that I'd found Javan. And he's got quite a story. So it turns out that, and again, you'll never know if this is true, but it doesn't matter if it's true because it's American mythology. It's folklore. The people in his time believed that the reason there was a color line in baseball was because he was so good that the white owners saw him and didn't want him anywhere near their teams. They thought he'd put all the white people out of work. Mm -hmm. They literally drew the color line for him. I mean, if you own an image, can you ask for a story better than this? No, right? It's as good as it gets. I don't care if it's true. We'll never know if it's true, but it also doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I wrote an essay about him, and it's really an essay about what we don't know, but that's what makes it an incredible story. You don't have to know all the answers. Mm -hmm. It's just the search and the the process of trying to find out is what's important. Yeah, that's a movie waiting to be written, right? right? (laughs) But we do know a little bit about him, right? Wasn't he the main catcher for George Stovey? Yes. Yeah. So in your 500 hours of research, what are the things that you did find out about who he was? I mean, I found all the things you'd find, you know, if you were writing a book report in sixth grade, who his parents were and where he was born, what day he was born. He was born on New Year's Day, actually. His father was, for that time, very successful. So one of the things that an African-American family could do at that time to make money in that area was to work as caterers because it was a more servile profession, but it was actually quite lucrative. So he worked for his father in a company called Emory & Son. And it's hard to know exactly how his father felt about his ball playing, but at one point he actually starred in a play that almost seems autobiographical for him where... His father wanted him to work harder, and he wanted just to play baseball. And he really just wanted fame and glory from baseball. And it's interesting because in the image, he's standing in front of a backdrop. It's a studio shot. Mm -hmm. We talked about Horner. Horner didn't shoot with a backdrop, but a lot of photographers earlier than Horner did use backdrops. And it's a little bit like the backdrop you would expect in a play. So it's almost like you're looking at him performing. Mm -hmm. And in the image, of course, he's wearing a mask. And... I called the essay, He Wears the Mask, because it's a famous poem called We Wear the Mask, about black people being unable to express who they really are at that time period, and instead wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a kind of compelling way to think about this story. And I'm trying to uncover any way I can to learn more about him. And I realized that I haven't tried to go back through the provenance of who owned this image before it got to me. Mm. I called a dealer who I'd bought it from over 20 years before, a guy named Bob McCann, and I said, Bob, do you remember who you bought this from? And he'd actually put me in touch with someone else who'd owned it before him. And I called that person, and he said he actually owned two negatives of Javan Emery. And my first thought was, oh, no. And oh, no, because I have to own this. Mm -hmm. And not only do I have to own it, I have to own it so badly that there's no limit to what I would pay. It's almost like getting hit by a car. (laughs) This is like a $10,000 bill. Right. And all I can think of is, oh, no. And he says to me, I gave it to someone for a book to publish. And while they were printing it, they dropped it and it shattered (sighs) and it shattered into so many pieces. They just threw the pieces away. So there was a pair, one with a mask and one without a mask. And that was the image with Javan's face visible. And I have the one where he's in a mask. And the fact that you'll never know now what he looks like goes to that what you're suggesting, this idea of asking questions and not having answers. Mm -hmm. We'll never know what he looks like. It was there, and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. I try as much as I can to, I mean, I really, really try to bring him to life 
in a way that doesn't require an image. Mm-hmm. I think I've succeeded, but other people can differ. But I, I'll tell you, I tried so hard. I mean, I put for every sentence that I wrote, I spent one hour for each sentence to try to bring him to life. And um, I'm mean, proud of the attempt, however it turned out. Yeah, what a heartbreaking loss of the other negative, though. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Joe Jackson. You've had a couple Joe Jackson images in your collection over the years. You also have a theory regarding a story that we've all been told for years, what we've always believed that Joe's famous bat, Black Betsy, was stained black with tobacco juice, but you don't think that's really how it was darkened. Why don't you think that, and how do you think it was darkened? I don't think that just because I've studied all the patents of early bats and came across a patent for darkening the barrel of a bat by turning on a lathe and holding a piece of black walnut against it to harden the hitting surface. It was believed that would help increase the hitting ability of a bat by hardening its surface through this friction and this heat. If you look at the patent application and the drawing that accompanies the patent, it looks exactly like a Black Betsy to me. Hmm. I don't know how you could actually permanently darken the surface of a bat with tobacco juice. I don't think it's possible. I'm sure it's possible with black walnut on a spinning lathe. Mm -hmm. And it actually makes sense to me why someone would spit on the end of the bat for a couple of months to try to darken it. I just, well, I don't understand. Wouldn't it have just been... Almost like uh, dipping the bat into a spittoon that had been full of tobacco juice instead of... I'm not sure that would permanently darken it. I mean, this is literally burning the surface of the bat with black walnut. Mm -hmm. Like, I know that's going to cause a darkening of the bat. I just don't think essentially like putting it into dark water for a couple of minutes is going to do that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a famous photo of Joe Jackson standing behind the counter at his liquor store in Greenville, Mm -hmm. South Carolina, which was taken in October of 1939. You've called that photo one of baseball's great images of failure. What do you mean by that, and what are some other examples of baseball's great images of failure? When I think of Joe Jackson, it gets a little bit into the debate about whether he should be let back into baseball or let back into the Hall of Fame or both. To me, Jackson took $5,000 in a pillowcase. The fact that he didn't throw the World Series is almost a negative because he essentially let his teammates do the dirty work. And he admitted in his grand jury testimony that he accepted the money. And when I think about Joe Jackson, I think about people like King Lear, and I think about Oedipus, and I ask myself, should we give Lear his eyes back? Should we give Oedipus his scepter over Thebes? Like, no. The whole beauty of those tragedies is that they end the way they end. Granted, those are fiction, mm-hmm. and this is real life, but to me, letting Jackson back into baseball is like giving King Lear his eyes back. It's impossible. What makes the whole story beautiful today is that he's banned. And in my mind, deservedly so. So when I see him where he's behind the counter in his store, to me it's like watching like Lear on the Heath. It's so poignant. That's the whole story right there. You mm-hmm. know, and there's a story that Ken Burns told that which I'm sure isn't true, but in which never stopped Ken Burns. Ken Burns tells the story of Ty Cobb coming into the store one day and saying, Don't you recognize me, Joe? And Joe saying, like, Of course I recognize you, Ty, but I didn't think anyone wanted me to recognize them. That actually is a true story. Is it really? Uh, Ty Cobb was with Grantland Rice. Really? And Grantland Rice is the one who wrote that story. So that that one actually is true. I'm I'm happy to be corrected, especially by you. Um. (laughs) But like you said, just because it was true or was not, that never stopped Ken Burns. There's a lot of stuff in the baseball documentary and in other documentaries of his that have been proven false. Before you even hear the Ty Cobb story, it's in that image. Mm -hmm. That image is all about banishment. It's Mm -hmm. all about someone who was once the absolute peak of what they do at the center of American news. And then he's behind a cash register. And it's just so poignant. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I just don't know how you get a better Shoeless Joe Jackson picture than that. What are some other images of baseball failure? There's a famous one by Barney Stein of Ralph Branca. He's just sitting on a step in the clubhouse somewhere, just having thrown a pitch to Bobby Thompson. And his head's kind of between his shoulders. And he looks like he's weeping. I mean, I've had those moments in Little League as a kid, you know, where you lose and you're crying, and and here's a professional going through the same thing. You know, it's just a wonderful image. There's another image I've seen that Ken Burns used where Brank is actually prone on the clubhouse floor weeping. And it turns out that Bobby Thompson stole a sign, uh, which is it's insult to injury. Yeah. But it's such a poignant image. And then there's another image by John Dominus of Sports Illustrated of uh, Mickey Mantle throwing his helmet which is thought to be like the greatest image of an athlete in decline that exists. But there just aren't that many. You know, Conlon's aging eyes images, in a way, are the first of Mm. failure. 
I hadn't really thought about that until just now, but you know, if you look at Hannes Wagner and Chief Meyer's eyes and the reportage that accompanies the essays there, mm-hmm. it's really about failure. Yeah. You announced that you've donated about 500 vintage Conlon prints to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in the press release, the Met describes Conlon as an American master photographer known for his distinctive poetic documentation of baseball. Why do you think it's important for people to not only see the work of people like Charles Conlon, but to know who they are? Like everyone has seen the picture of Willie Mays making the catch in the 1954 World Series, but you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who knows who the photographer was. Sure. Why does that matter? I think photography is all about getting other people to see what you see. That's why I photograph. Deanne Arbus once said, I photograph because if I didn't, no one would see what I'm trying to show them. They're ephemeral, they exist for seconds, and if I don't photograph them, no one will and they'll be gone. Mm. And I think there's a lot to that, this idea that someone's trying so hard, they're almost shaking you, saying, like, look at what I see. It's like someone has a personal vision, which doesn't extend just to one photograph, but to tens of thousands of images, And you can actually see some of that larger vision across the whole collection. That, to me, is that's what makes a photographer. And that's what Charles Conlon has that so many other baseball photographers don't have. It's interesting to think that a photo shows you how that person saw that moment. But a collection of their photos shows you how they viewed the world. It's very personal. Something other than love, but something about that deeper vision that a photographer has that can come through like a whole photographic essay and then a whole series and then a whole lifetime of work. Like I said, like I can look at a Conlon and I can tell you it's a Conlon without ever turning it over. Mm -hmm. I just know in a way how we saw the world. It's recognizable to me after looking at thousands of them for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Now I know. Yeah. So donating a bunch of prints to the Metropolitan Museum of Art is definitely a cool way to thin out your collection. I'm sure you've also sold a bunch of stuff over the years too. Is there a piece that you regret letting go of? Oh, there's so many. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I sold a Lou Gehrig full uniform with a four on the back and Gehrig chain stitching and the collar and the tail and the pants for about $20,000. And I think I paid 15. I sold it for 20. Maybe I paid 18. I sold it for 20. Like, I was okay. I sold it at Christie's, you know, where I thought, like, I'd really do well. I can't imagine it's not in the millions today even though it wasn't in great condition it was because it had the four Mm -hmm. that was that was hard to take (laughs) Uh, i owned a photograph of josh gibson that i bought for about 7500 at christie's i can't remember what auction house i sold it through but it went for about 7500 so i thought to myself all right you didn't lose any money Mm -hmm. and i just found out a couple of months ago that it sold for 160,000. That one hurts. Which image is it? I mean, is it a recognizable one or is it? For someone who specializes in Negro League stuff, they would recognize it. Uh I think the most powerful portrait of Josh Gibson ever taken. It's a portrait of him where he's kind of after a game and sweating. And behind him on the wall is a mask and one of his gloves hanging up on the wall. It was an image shot by the same photographer the same day where he's smiling, which just doesn't work for me for Gibson Mm -hmm. because it's this tragic story of this person who always wandered across the color line. And again, Ken Burns with his potentially unverifiable mythology, he relates a story that Josh Gibson went mad once and had to be put in a straitjacket or in some kind of restraints and kept yelling that Joe DiMaggio wouldn't recognize him. Something about that in this portrait, something about that suffering that's captured in this portrait that isn't in the smiling photograph taken the same day. Mm -hmm. That's another one. It's interesting. I I discovered the first baseball card ever, which was a carte de visite albumen photograph of Harry Wright. And Harry Wright had produced it in 1862 as a ticket to the grounds of the St. George Cricket Club. And I went to the New York Public Library and I looked it up and I looked in Harry Wright's diaries and it turned out he'd recorded everything about producing these. He wanted them to be used as tickets. He wrote down how much it cost him. He wrote down how many he sold. He wrote down how much money he made. And I went to one of the auction houses and I said, look, this was produced in quantity. It was meant to be collected. I think it's a baseball card. And they agreed. And I bought it for roughly $2,000 and I sold it for $72,000 once it was viewed as a baseball card, which is, I think, ridiculous. (laughs) And... um, I've kind of regretted selling it, even though I made so much money, because it's an important piece for a photo collector. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like one of the stories I've tried to tell, and I've kind of given up in a way, is the whole history of photography in America through baseball. 
I've always wanted to tell that story. It's just not an easy story to tell. For any collector, it's a very expensive story to tell because you've got to start in the 1840s and go mm -hmm. to the present. It involves a lot of images. But one of the things that gave me the idea was that I found two newspaper articles by Walt Whitman in the 1840s, I believe for the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, where in one he talks about seeing photographs for the first time in New York, in a window in, on Broadway in New York, I believe. And then the next week, he sees baseball for the first time. And that's where he has that famous quote about it in our sundown perambulations and talks about seeing baseball. And um, I just thought how extraordinary it is in one week, if you're living in Brooklyn, for the first time to see photography and baseball. And these things were kind of, they appeared conjoined mm -hmm. in New York. But they, they just appeared randomly together. And then you can follow their progress all through the different eras of wet plate photography, the George Baines and the Paul Thompsons of the world and the news agencies and the Daily News and the picture newspapers. And you can tell that whole story going through to the present. It's a story I've always wanted to tell, but I've never found a way to do it successfully with objects. Hmm. You also mentioned you used to have a photo of the 1917 White Sox in the dugout that you regretted letting go. Why that particular photo? Because they're being photographed. I don't believe Colin's in the image. But you can see all the people who compete with him are in the image. And you can see a little bit about the relationship of the photographers to the subjects and what it was like to work as a photographer at that time. And, of course, the Sox uniform at that time is probably the greatest uniform is ever made. You can take the word probably out of that <laughs> sentence. It's, it's always been my favorite. Yeah. yeah. Are you still actively collecting? And if you are, do you have a white whale, like something you've been after for years but just haven't been able to obtain? One of the themes I'm pursuing is the history of the color line in America. So I'm trying to tell the Jackie Robinson story, but in a much larger context so that Robinson's less of an important figure in it. Of all the men like Javan Emery, who we talked about before, who've preceded him and who paved the way for him. And there are two things I've always wanted for that exhibition, which is primarily photography related, but I try to fill it in with objects that help tell the story and set the context. And one of them is the ticket that would have been used for opening day 1947 to see Jackie Robinson play. That has increased in value roughly 10 times over the last five years, which makes it prohibitive. Mm -hmm. And the other is a six-sheet movie poster of the Jackie Robinson story from 1950. The six-sheet, I couldn't tell you exactly how large it is, but it's enormous. You know, it's like eight feet by nine feet or some crazy proportion like that. Mm -hmm. The first time it went up for sale and I couldn't afford it, it was X dollars, and now it's at least 2X. So, you know, there's a constant theme. Mm -hmm. Very few people can afford everything. Those people have great collections, but again, I, I respect those collections a little less. Having struggled to acquire what I've always wanted, it felt I needed to acquire mm -hmm. to tell a story I wanted. And I, I kind of like that struggle a little bit. Yeah. It's not as fun to be able to just always open your wallet and be able to afford every single thing that you see. And right. And it makes having a focus harder because you don't need to have a focus because you can afford everything. Exactly. Yeah. If there's one thing that you hope people take away from this interview after listening to it, what would you hope that to be? I think that photography as a medium is so rich and collecting as a medium is so rich. I really believe that collectors are artists in their own way, that a photographer sets out to make everyone who sees his or her images to see the world the way they see it that they have something unique in their vision and they're kind of grabbing you and saying, I want you to see this. Unless you look at my image, you're never going to see it. Mm -hmm. And a collector does something very similar. To be a collector is to every day cast a net and try to find what you're looking for. But you're also juxtaposing two objects so that there's this emergent property. So that you have the first object and the second object. And what you do when you bring them together produces something entirely different than either of those two objects as separate individual objects. And all of a sudden, there's a story that emerges from putting those two things side by side. Going back to Ansel Adams, I was at a show once, and someone had two prints by Ansel Adams. One printed before he had selenium toner, and one printed after he had selenium toner. It's a little technical, mm -hmm. I'll admit. Mm -hmm. But the images were so different, and you knew that most people liked the earlier one, and Ansel Adams liked the later one. And I never really appreciated how important that toning was to him until I saw those things side by side, and it was mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. And if this one collector who's based in Connecticut hadn't put those things side by side, I'd still never know. Like, by putting those things together, he taught me. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to do. I want to teach people how to see, based on what I've learned, they don't have to go through 25 years of camping out with someone with no electricity to learn how to do this. <laughs> I want to just show you a couple of things, and you'll get it. Mm -hmm. 
So in a way, there's like a teaching aspect, but there's a joy in that teaching. And that's what I hope people get out of photography, that they don't have to be a great photographer to do this. You just have to want to learn what you find compelling and why you find it compelling. Mm -hmm. And that's a great jumping off point. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you would have liked to have gotten to? No, I think it was uh, more than I expected. It was really uh, (laughs) as thorough as I could have imagined. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, how can people reach out to you and keep up with you if they want to follow up? I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. What's your Instagram handle? It's Paul Rieferson. One word. All right. All right, now it's time for a segment called What'd You Think, Mom? where we talk to my mom who just listened to the interview with me and we ask her what she thinks. This is my real, actual mom. Her name is Lori, but I've always just called her mom. Can you say something to prove that you are my mom? Yes. Besides you doing self-portraits, I'm the person who's taken the most photographs of you in your life. Yeah, probably. Yeah. They're available at a price. But I don't take many pictures of myself, so even with doing selfies you've taken more pictures of me than me i think so too but yeah. you have the advantage of doing a timer and mm-hmm. you know so when you're out on adventures and trips you take photos that way so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i'm not sure where we'd be it's a toss-up all right mm-hmm. we'll call it a draw but that's just one story the other story that i think of to share with this particular episode is one of my favorite birthday presents which i have framed in my office is a photograph that you took when you were in college of a cemetery, which is always a dear topic to my heart. I love being in cemeteries. But it's a black and white photo of a cemetery on a hillside with mist within it. And it captures all the things I love about photography like that. And that is one of my favorite birthday presents that you took with the photo, printed it, framed it. Developed it in the dark room. Right. Yeah, everything. Yeah, in high school, I took a bunch of AP classes. And so I went into college with enough credits to be a first semester sophomore. If I wanted to graduate early, I could have taken full course loads and been done in three years. Or I could have taken smaller course loads and been done in four years. And I was like, I'd rather stick around for four years and experience college. You still needed to have enough credits each semester to qualify as a full-time student. So... I had to take courses that I otherwise wouldn't have taken. And Mm -hmm. so one semester I took a bowling class and one semester I took a basketball class. But I also was able to take things like film analysis and I took this photography class. So just like Paul is saying in our interview, he wanted to learn these things. And, you know, he takes a bunch of photos now. And when I was in college, it was right around the time when digital cameras were really becoming like popularized you know i had them in high school and you could take them around and carry them in your pocket and stuff but really nice like point and shoot dslr cameras were becoming much more affordable that you could have a legitimate nice camera with you for not a ton of money it was Mm -hmm. still a couple hundred bucks and i was like all right well if i'm going to take a bunch of photos like that i might as well learn what everything does and what is an aperture and like the things that we kind of discussed in this interview Mm -hmm. and so yeah i loved that class i don't remember a ton of the photos that i took in it But I do remember the lessons, and that was a great class. I'm glad I took that. Yeah. When any photographer takes a photo, the two of you discussed it in the interview as well. It may be just a moment in time, but when you're looking at that photograph, you're looking at it through the photographer's eyes as well, and Mm -hmm. you're seeing how he or she interpreted what they were looking at. I like the black and white aspect of things, though. What I really like is the early stages of photography Mm -hmm. with black and white because they just didn't have color yet versus the choice to make today. Mm -hmm. I do like black and white photography as well. That being said, what did you think of the Paul Rieferson interview? I felt like I was listening to my own journey with how I got so interested in how baseball started and everything else which was through reading. And when Paul mentioned the glory years of baseball that he read as a fifth grader, right, you open up that book and forget about it. Don't talk to me until I'm done with this book. The stories are just so compelling and so interesting because it puts things on a human level. And that's the exact same thing that Conlon's photography does. The first time I saw Baseball's Golden Age, the book of Conlon photographs, first of all, the cover just grabs you. And when Paul said that he owned that photograph, Mm -hmm. that just blew me away. The way Paul describes how he felt when he first was seeing Conlon's photographs, he said those were some of the most compelling images he had ever seen. Mm -hmm. And I thought that word was so critical. To me, they were mesmerizing. 
And that book with images was the same way I felt as I did with the stories in The Glory Years of Baseball, where when I pick up that book, even today, after owning it for years already and seeing it many times, it doesn't matter. The impact of the photographs when you look at them, they just draw you in, whether it is the eye photographs or the Murderer's Row series You just have to study it. There's so much to it, and it is unlike any other photographer of that era. And there's some reason. What is the reason? What Mm -hmm. was his gift? And so I totally get why Paul was on a mission to solve the mystery. Mm -hmm. I love that he tried to, and I love that he collected and preserved because that's so critical. So many things, like whether it's through purging because you need space in your office or your home or whatever, So many things are lost, and I think Paul really did service by collecting and preserving, going through the personal expense of making sure that he had the right archival protections in place to preserve these things for American history. Mm -hmm. And it really is an obligation, and as historians, you and I totally get that. Yeah. I think Conlon's photography informed the way that I photograph. You know, I used to run a record label and have photographed tons of bands at concerts and for press things and all, you know, just over the years. And I used to help a buddy of mine out, Mike Fellomley. He started a thing called Live from the Rock Room, where he would have bands come in who were on tour and his basement, he turned into like a recording studio and like practice space. And so he would record bands playing, you know, two or three or four songs and take video and still photography and then put those out as like free promotion and publicity for these young touring bands. Mm -hmm. Mike used to be the drummer of Alkaline Trio and Smoking Popes and like some bigger bands. So he's got some pretty important and famous friends. So like, yeah, some of those bands came through, but also just young touring bands who didn't have money or access to publicity like this. So Mike was doing them a favor and helping them out. And so I was helping him out taking still photography and Without even consciously realizing what I was doing, I was doing what Conlon was doing and taking extreme close-ups of their hands on the instruments and Mm -hmm. like especially guitar players, obviously, or taking pictures of their feet next to their pedal boards. Mm -hmm. And I was taking Charles Conlon's photos, not consciously, but like that was interesting to me and to see how are these people doing their craft Exactly. The way that Conlon wasn't a baseball expert when he started. I wasn't a music expert in terms of playing instruments. Mm -hmm. So I was wanting to like show myself, how are they doing this? Right. You also talked about the photo on the cover of the book. That was big Ed Walsh, who we mentioned in the interview a handful of times. He helped the hitless wonders Chicago White Sox win the 1906 World Series, allowing only seven hits and one earned run while striking out 17 Cubs in his 15 innings of work that series. The Sox won both games he started in that World Series, and he was an all-time great pitcher. He's in the Hall of Fame. He was inducted in 1946, but he led the league in innings pitched four times in six years, from 1907 to 1912. He led the league in games pitched five times in those six years. He's the all-time Major League Baseball leader with a career 1.82 ERA. Among modern pitchers, so from 1901 to the present day, only Addie Joss at 1.89 registered a career ERA below 2. So not only did Big Ed Walsh have the record, he is so much further below anybody else. It's incredible. Mm Mm-hmm. Big Ed Walsh also is the most recent pitcher to win 40 games in a season, which he did in 1908. Only Christy Mathewson, who had 37 wins that year, and Walter Johnson, who had 36 in 1913, have come within five wins of 40 since Walsh did it. So he's a name who most people don't know. If you've heard the name, you don't know the stats. You don't know how great he was. He is one of the best pitchers who's ever lived. Yeah. His 10-year peak was basically unrivaled. Mm Mm-hmm. You mentioned Christy Mathewson, and I have to go there. It was Conlon's photos that drew me to Christy Mathewson. Mm -hmm. After seeing those photos, I wanted to know more about who was this guy. And so, you know, I did research and whatever and learned the tragic story. And now to this day, any bit of information or any photograph or whatever, if it's Christy Mathewson, I'm on it. And it's because of seeing him through Conlon's eyes that that passion became part of my life. Mm Mm-hmm. The thing about his photos is they just draw you in. When Paul was talking about how you look at the eyes photographs and you can actually look close enough where you're looking in the iris and you see the reflection of Conlon, I had done that. And it just is crazy, Mm -hmm. you know. Think about on a national historic level, not just baseball or sports, but think of American presidents, for example, and how 
what do we have to rely on for how we perceive Washington and Adams and Jefferson and other founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, Hamilton, you get it. The first president was not photographed until 1843. That's John Quincy Adams. He's already out of office for 14 years. But compare how we look at the founding fathers, the first group of guys, against Abraham Lincoln, Mm -hmm. who we have photographs where we see the physical impact, the changes, the stress, just drawing down this man, and it changes our whole perception. So instead of a painting that is through an artist's eyes, and the painter may or may not be good. You know, you look at different paintings of Jefferson, for example. Sometimes it doesn't even look like the same person. Or if they're commissioned by the subject, yeah, you better make me look good. Right. <laughs> so he might be a great painter, but painting inaccurately. Yeah. You know? Just in the course of humanity, photography is so important. During the Civil War, you had Matthew Brady out on the battlefield for the first time taking photographs. And those photographs, which were then published in newspapers back home, you know, Harper's Weekly, seeing dead, bloated bodies on a battlefield, even looking at those photos today from 1863, you're just stunned Mm -hmm. by what you're looking at. That was much different than seeing an artist hand drawing Mm -hmm. of that same scene. But I think it's also different when you're taking a photo and like bringing it back to baseball. If you're standing in the crowd on the second deck of the stands and just taking a panoramic shot of the field, anybody can do that. You're standing there and you're shooting what you see. But Conlon's ability to take these portraits and again with Christy Mathewson saying Charlie can be trusted always. Right. That's what set him apart and made him so great is he had a the access Mm -hmm. And then B, the trust, because you can have access, but people still might not trust you. Right. But he had their trust. And like Paul was talking about, the way you can see them relating to the camera, the way you can see in their eyes. He told the story about Hannes Wagner kicking Charlie out and saying, no, you can't take my picture right now because he was protecting the relationship. Right. You can see that in Conlon's photos where you don't necessarily see that in Carl J. Horner's T206 card set photos, the portraits or the photos that were taken for the Paul Thompson agency or George Grantham Bain agency, like they had access to, but the people taking those photos didn't necessarily have the relationship with their subjects that Conlon had with his. So you're getting these incredible opportunities to take images and you're getting them, you are taking these images and you're having photos that nobody else has, but it's not the same glow in their eyes. It's not the same love that in openness right and you see that in the murderer's rose shots for example right and even if it's not a marquee player mm-hmm. though i don't know how many of non-marquee players there were on murderer's row but even in those photographs you just see the guy you see the human being and everything else that goes with that and it's just an open no curtain in front of those eyes mm-hmm. During our interview, Paul mentioned this idea that Charles Conlon had about the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection occurring both in optics, in photography, and in baseball. Since we recorded this interview, Paul has given it some more thought, and he thinks that Charles Conlon may have actually been onto something with that. He's not quite sure, but he's not ruling out the possibility as quickly as Homer and Baker did, who shot Conlon down immediately and wrote him off as kind of crazy for having that concept and trying to tie the photography world to baseball. So if you go back and listen to that part of the interview Paul wasn't quite sure either. He was just like, yeah, it's interesting that Conlon tried to make that happen. But we recorded this a while ago. And in that time, Paul has thought about it. And he's like, you know what? He might have been, he doesn't necessarily think that he's right, Mm -hmm. but he's giving it more thought at this point. And I think that's interesting too. I thought it was really important when he was talking about how he hadn't only been collecting the photos, but he was collecting objects within the photographs Mm -hmm. and pairing those two collections. Mm -hmm. You mentioned how in the Chilistro Jackson Museum, how you did different spots of that. And what we would see when visitors came in, every spot where you had something like that, and there were multiple places, that was the best reaction, you know, the ooh and ah moment, because now you're, again, making the person real. Mm -hmm. You know, there are photographs all over the place. But when you have the objects that filled his world, and they're right there, even though they're not his... It's a perception that you wouldn't otherwise get. You know, there's something about seeing a room set up just the way it was when he lived there. Mm -hmm. And so to do it with these baseball photographs and with the bats, the photographs are so valuable. The Mm -hmm. bats are so valuable. And then you pair those things together, and it's just a crazy experience to see those things together. 
the word that we always use when talking about this kind of stuff is that it humanizes them right. and it takes it from being just this dead guy in a history book who you read about a hundred times right. to this was a person who mm-hmm. lived a life and yeah, maybe he was a baseball player. Maybe he was the president of the United States or maybe he invented something, but somebody went to high school with that guy, you know, like yeah. he had a childhood friend mm-hmm. and he had a favorite type of sandwich, you know, like those are things that people don't think about until you see like oh yeah this is how his living room was set up and this is exactly where he sat and we've got a photo of him sitting here and to me that was the greatest impact especially having that museum be his house Mm -hmm. well you better have some of it set up like a house right otherwise what's the point in having the museum be in the house you could have just built any building right it was difficult to do because we had no budget Mm -hmm. and the things that are available are hundreds of thousands of dollars Right. And already in private collections, just because they exist doesn't mean that they are available. Right. But yeah, that was one of my favorite parts of running that museum was tracking down... Mm -hmm. The hunt. Yeah, the history. And you can just hear in Paul's voice that that's his favorite part too. The Right. Learning the history, doing the research, spending 500 hours trying to figure out who Javon Emery was. Right. Going to the New York Public Library and looking through census records, things we both have done, Mm -hmm. that is part of it. And you're pulling the thread to unravel the mystery and get as close to that person's real story as you can. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to share that story. And you do. And that's the beauty of that. If you guys subscribe to the Clearing the Bases newsletter that I started for the podcast, you guys might have read that on my birthday this past year, I went to the Jackie Robinson Museum in New York and mm-hmm. I went with Paul. He was in town in New York for the holidays. My birthday's right around Thanksgiving and I knew he was going to be in town. And I realized after he and I did this interview that we didn't take a picture together. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I do with every single person right. I've interviewed, but I just, it slipped my mind or I don't even remember how it didn't happen. But literally as I was driving away from his house, I was like, oh no. <laughs> Yeah, now what? Oh, well. And we've seen each other a handful of times since then, but it just didn't happen. Right. And I was like, okay, Paul, your interview's coming out in like six weeks. Mm-hmm. We have to take a picture together. And he's like, okay, okay, okay. So we meet up at the Jackie Robinson Museum. And it was interesting for me to go through that museum with Paul because A, he donated something to the museum. The photo of Ben Chapman and the Philadelphia Phillies taunting Jackie Robinson at Ebbets Field on April 22nd, 1947. That scene is kind of depicted in the movie 42. Mm -hmm. But just as somebody who is into artifacts and knows, you heard him talk about it in the interview, he wants to put his artifacts and his images together in a way that tells the story. He's always interested in just because you have something cool doesn't mean anything unless you display it and describe it in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. So to watch him go through that museum and be like, this is what I would have done, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. It was cool. And I know he felt the same way about going through that museum with me as a former museum director Mm -hmm. and somebody who has laid out museums before. It was interesting for him to see what I liked and what I didn't like Mm -hmm. about that museum. And there was much more that I liked than I didn't like, but there were things I didn't like. Right. And without changing a single piece that they had on display, just changing the way they're displayed, Mm -hmm. I think that place could have been better and like more interactive. You know, you had things that were like buttons to push and knobs to turn and things like that, which are things that kids love to do. Mm -hmm. And they had them six feet high. And it's like, you're just missing it. Right. Things like that. And so Paul and I were talking about that as we're going through the museum. And I know it was fun for him. I'm just as fun for me to go through that museum with him as well. But talking about how if Paul were going to have a museum or a show in a museum, which is something that he's going to have at some point, his show for the color line in baseball, that's Mm -hmm. going to be in New York somewhere. But having him talk about possibly obtaining those Charles Conlon cameras. Right. Regardless of the fact that they were his or not, which what an awful feeling. Yeah. Especially at the price point. Yeah. But to have those types of cameras and hearing him talk about the Graflex being invented and how it changed the way people could shoot, which changed the way that people at home could see. Right. All of these things are tied together and it makes you a better fan. It makes you understand the game more. It makes you understand the people more. And to me, that's the most interesting thing about hearing Paul talk about all that is he understands that and he understands how all of these things are connected. The depths to which he went to learn the processes himself and experience them himself so that his opinions are so informed Mm -hmm. and his base of knowledge is so much more expanded when he looks at something. Mm -hmm. That's dedication. That is, (laughs) that's being a true researcher and really wanting to know your passion. Going over to the Graflex is like 
with artists when you went from having to paint in the studio to all of a sudden having paint where you were able to go outside and all of a sudden you have the impressions and all these people are now going out to the countryside or whatever. The surge in creativity that you had in painting happened because of that in mm-hmm. the same way that this happened. Yeah, absolutely. Just a different medium. Definitely. When he was talking about the Javon Emery photograph, I love that every day I'm seeing more and more photographs of Negro League players. And of course, the Negro League Museum in Kansas City has a wealth of information and objects and photographs and everything. But you're seeing them in other places as well. And I think it's great. And to have those photographs available and merge that with now the Sabre Landmarks Committee graves map, for me personally... One of my goals this year is I have a whole itinerary here in the Chicago area because there are two key cemeteries where a lot of players are buried and some key figures, including Ruth Foster. And so now in conjunction with the way the Graves Map website is set up, when photos are available, those are integrated into the information when you're visiting the grave. Mm -hmm. That, again, just helps inform you and makes that person real. When Paul was describing that photograph of Josh Gibson, Mm -hmm just the weight of not being able to burst through that color line when his abilities were as strong as, if not far in excess of, many of the players who were on the other side of the color line. Yeah, Bob Kendrick loves to tell the story about how Josh Gibson is called the Black Babe Ruth, but really Babe Ruth was the white Josh Gibson. There you go. How frustrating that must have been. Yeah. Frustrating doesn't even begin to cover it. Demoralizing. You do really see that. You know, It's not that you're looking for something. But you can just see the way it is. And that happens in photographs between the races in all aspects of life. Mm -hmm. You can just see the demeanor. It's just different. Mm -hmm. There's a weight upon them. Yeah, I think another interesting concept that Paul brought up is something I had never really consciously thought about in this way was 1920 being the line of demarcation. Right. You know, before Chapman's death and after Chapman's death in terms of, like Paul talked about, before that moment, there is not a single great moment in baseball history that is captured on film. Yeah. And after that moment, they all are. And for two people that are constantly thinking about the pitch that killed and Ray right. Chapman's right. death, like you'd think we would have put that together, <laughs> yeah. but I never had. Yeah. Of course, the aftermath, once he passes away, there's photographs of the floral arrangements. There's photographs of mm-hmm. Tris Speaker in grief and all that is conveyed. But you don't think about how is it possible when Paul describes the scene of Tris Speaker and Smokey Joe Wood carrying him off the field as best friends. Mm -hmm. And it's incomprehensible to us where every single moment is captured, not only in baseball, but in life. You know, there's so many things around us. But not even we are individually capturing that moment for ourselves. But if you're in a stadium like that today... You've got 20,000 people with cameras who would all be shooting it. Right. So it wouldn't just be one photograph. It would be every angle from the entire stadium. Every single person in that stadium would be taking a picture of it and uploading it to social media immediately. Right. And that moment we'll never see. Right. That is an interesting... That was a light bulb going off. Never thought of it that way, but it's Mm -hmm. so obvious. A concept that Paul talks about multiple times is that collectors are artists in their own ways and to me that is his artistry everybody has thought of that moment everybody has heard of it or read about it Mm -hmm. a lot of people have read the book that was him putting the Ansel Adams prints next to each other one with the selenium toner and one without it like that was him being like here this is what I see I want you to see it this way too right how there's a teaching aspect to being a collector yeah and there's a thought process of Where do objects of great history belong? Do they belong in private collections or do they belong in museums? Mm -hmm. This has come up in another aspect of life, which is, for me, the history side in Lincoln memorabilia, for example. Mm -hmm. I've heard one gentleman speak about this where he said, you can make the choice of which is better, but think about how often you might have something in a museum and a museum can only display so many pieces within its collection at any given time. Mm -hmm. So you might have your very important piece relegated to the bowels of a museum, Mm -hmm. never to see the light of day, versus letting it come up for sale to a collector who, if you're someone like Paul, you're sharing it through essays Mm -hmm. or personal visits when people come and you're imbuing them with the knowledge that you have about the piece that you collected. Mm -hmm. You're keeping history alive on a non-museum level. It's personal. They can see it. They can touch the object. It's a way to keep people interested in history 
and value that these objects should be cared for and preserved. Yeah, the fact that whether it's the Art Institute of Chicago or the National Baseball Hall of Fame or any type of museum, any major museum, has 10 times the amount of things in storage and in their archives at least than they have on display. Right. And so the idea of is it better for the museums to have those things and then nobody ever sees them again, or you have a collector like Gary Cypress who his collection was just kind of put on display within the past few weeks on a TikTok video. Oh. His house or one of his houses is completely decorated like a baseball museum. And he has these things on display and incredible artifacts, original jerseys from the 1800s, original wow. gloves, original advertisements, just unbelievably. I mean, he could have a museum if he wanted to charge admission, people would go to that place. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that social media can do is that those artifacts being in the archives of the Hall of Fame or being in the archives of some other museum or collection what good is that doing for the common person? What right. good is that doing for the public good isn't advanced by that. Right. Where sure, you've got to seek out that video on social media to understand the impact and to see the breadth and depth of his collection, but it is possible. Right. And to see it in that setting versus even if a museum catalogs their collection and you go to the website and you look at a clinical photograph of something mm -hmm. just sitting on a beige background mm -hmm. to highlight it, mm -hmm. you're not getting the context of it mm -hmm. relative to other objects that are gonna help inform you to its purpose for the way it is in this kind of setting. Right. We were just talking about how every little marker of importance within baseball, the Hall of Fame is right there to take the shoes or take the bat or take the hat, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then what? You know, So it might be on display for a few months in the heat of the moment where mm -hmm. it's important but then it's relegated in the back, you know, and there's just no way when you think of the thousands of objects that they have. Mm -hmm. And that's a shame. At least with the Hall of Fame, you can go as a person and request, can I go into the archives and can I do research on this player or this team? And they'll be like, yep, here's everything we have about Eddie Seacott. Mm -hmm. But unless you're doing that. <laughs> right. The average person isn't right. thinking that they have the authority to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. There is something to be said about having everything in one place that you know, okay, if I go to Cooperstown, New York, I'm going to be able to find a bunch of stuff. Right. But that means that it's nowhere else. There's pros and cons to there it. There is pros and cons. The main thing is those items are preserved. Right. That's the key. And by a staff that knows how to do it right. properly and appropriately. And like Paul was talking about with his own collection, if there needs to be conservation. Right. You know, especially with paper goods and mm -hmm. photographs. Not everybody knows how to handle it in the first place, let alone preserve it or conserve it. Or have the funding to do it properly. Right. There's definitely a role for museums. I'm a firm believer in museums, right. but I do see the side of having conscientious collectors who also serve a great purpose too. Mm -hmm. The bad thing about any industry or any field where things are of monetary value is you're going to have collectors like Barry Halper or yeah. like some of these other guys who they're not in it for the right reasons. Right. Maybe they started in it for the right reasons, but they see, oh man, this Lou Gehrig game worn uniform, mm -hmm. shirt and pants, and the shirt's got the number four on the back. I just bought it for $20,000 and it's worth millions. Mm -hmm. Well, I can make a couple of those. Right. We just talked to Peter Capolino. Right. If I can find a guy like that, I can fake yeah. a couple of these uniforms. And it isn't until somebody suggests to the Hall of Fame that that Shoeless Joe Jackson 1917 World Series uniform that you've had on display for years isn't real. And they put it under the scrutiny of actual tests and realize that the thread that was connecting the SOX logo to the uniform wasn't even invented till the 1940s. Right. You always have to view things with a set right. of eyes that is skeptical. Absolutely. And that's since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. There have always been the scam artists, you know, wherever there's that opportunity, someone's going to try and take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Crazy to think that at Conlon's peak, there were somewhere between 40 and 50,000 images in his home <laughs> and only 8,000 have survived. I mean, to think of how great some of the photos are in that 8,000, right? 40,000 is five times that amount. So are there five times more great images that we'll never see because they were just thrown out because he couldn't hold 40,000 glass plate negatives? Right. I love the question of what was the culling process? <laughs> yeah. What made the cut? Right. Was it chronological? Was it subject quality? What, mm -hmm. you know, what was... Yeah. Maddening to think about what we've lost. Right. Compared to what has survived. Right.
The other thing that Paul is an expert on, and we didn't really talk about it too much, was the evolution of the baseball and early baseball equipment. And we didn't talk about that because he's also probably the world's expert on Charles Conlon right. <laughs> and his photographs. So Paul and I talked about that, but we will have a future episode on the evolution of the baseball. But one of the things that Paul brought up was the idea that Black Betsy was not stained with tobacco juice, in mm-hmm. his opinion. Mm-hmm. And... I'm not sure how I feel about that. I could be persuaded either way. But when Paul's talking about how he has studied the patent for the lathe that yes. turns black yes. walnut, and he's like, this is how other black bats of that era were stained black. Right. So I don't know if Black Betsy was done that way, but I know that a bunch of other bats were done that way. Right. That's kind of hard to argue with. Right. I kind of always just imagined that, like I said in during our talk, that there was just a big vat or spittoon Mm-hmm. full of tobacco juice that people had spat in for weeks or months or whatever. And then they just dipped the bat in there and stained it for who knows how long. But Paul wasn't convinced that that was something that A, somebody would do, and B, that even if they did that, would that stain the bat dark enough the way that quote-unquote Black Betsy appears in photos over the years? And he's not convinced. So, okay, yeah, who, who am I to argue with him? So you're the image that you put in my head of this vat that is big enough... <laughs> Because it has to be relatively tall Mm -hmm. to get to the height of the bat where the bat was stained. Mm -hmm. I am so grossed out by that. I was thinking there would be tobacco juice that he would just take a cloth and he's Mm -hmm. rubbing and polishing Black Betsy with this Mm -hmm. tobacco juice. And that's what I'm going to have in my head. Or I like Paul's idea even better. And it's not as disgusting, but it Mm -hmm. makes total sense because when you look at how evenly the demarcation between Mm -hmm. the blackness and the light color of the handle. Right. Yeah. I don't think juice is quite as uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) cooperative in that demarcation line. Yeah. But one of my favorite things about Paul is that not to toot my own horn, but I'm one of the world's experts on Joe Jackson Mm -hmm. at this point. And I get to talk to Paul and he makes me think about things in a different way that right. like I never even considered that, you know, maybe this makes me a bad researcher or just a bad scholar, but like we've been told that story a thousand times that right. this is how Black Betsy was colored. So, okay, that's the story. It was stained with tobacco juice. Mm-hmm. I should have looked into it and didn't. And Paul in one throwaway comment is like, no, that's silly. This is how it was done. Yeah. And he is knowledgeable enough about enough topics that like he can make those comments about so many different parts of baseball. And as we heard in the interview, King Lear and, you know, like mm-hmm. he's bringing up photographers and art and culture. And, right. you know, he's been to Europe a billion times. Like he is maybe the smartest person I know. He's well versed in many different aspects of life and literature and everything. Even the very first comment he made about where he grew up, Mm -hmm. Emerson, you know, like the fact that he's been thinking about this stuff since he was a child. Right. He needs to learn always. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite thing about Paul. That sense of curiosity and having to know and doing the work to get the knowledge Mm -hmm. and then having the receipts. Yeah. I think the best quote was when he was talking about the documentary and one of the lines from that was, we don't take pictures, we are taken by pictures. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I Mm -hmm. love that line. Yeah, lots of fun. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dan. Loved it. Okay, so that's it. In the introduction of this episode, I mentioned how there are a handful of ways for you to follow the podcast online. In addition to liking, subscribing, and giving My Baseball History a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app, Please make sure you're also following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where we are at Shoeless Podcast on each platform. By following us there, you'll get some bonus content throughout the month, and you'll be able to interact with us to let us know what you think of the show. You can also sign up for Clearing the Bases, our email newsletter, by heading to shoelesspodcast.substack.com. We publish two newsletters a month, which allow us to talk about things that we don't normally talk about on the show. I'll use that space to talk about the podcast, of course, but I'll also use it to write about baseball road trips I go on, to publish research I do, and to speak on current events in baseball, all of which are things I don't really do in episodes of My Baseball History. Look for a new issue to be published on the second Friday and the fourth Friday of every month. If you have questions about the podcast or research you'd like to contribute to a future newsletter, submit something through the contact form on our website or email us at shoelesspodcast at gmail.com. If you have ideas for guests you'd like us to talk to on the podcast, send us your list. If you know current or former baseball players, managers, 
broadcasters, or journalists who you can help us get in touch with, or if you are one, let's talk. During our interview, Paul mentioned a handful of the places where Charles Conlon's photos were originally published, places where the average person was seeing his photos for the first time, whether those photos were actively being attributed to Conlon or not. The first time I remember being actively aware of who Charles Conlon was, I had just gotten a bunch of baseball cards with his photos on them. The set came out in 1991, and I had just turned five years old when I got it. The Sporting News Conlon Collection set consisted of 330 cards, more than 100 of which were of Hall of Famers. Each card was simply but beautifully laid out. The front had a black border with white text surrounding a gorgeous black and white photo. Like most sports cards, the text told you who the person was and what team they were on and what position they played if they were a player. But something additional that I liked about this set was it also told you what year the photo was taken. If the person on the front had been inducted into the Hall of Fame, there was a black diagonal stripe across the top right corner of the photo telling you which year they were inducted, whether that was as a player, a manager, or as an umpire. Even at an early age, I loved the fact that every card followed the same visual format. And I love that those stripes made the cards that had them feel special. I love the minimalism of the black and white photos, and the fact that the borders and backs of the cards followed suit, regardless of the fact that I didn't even know what minimalism was. I was just a little kid, first learning about baseball and the history of the sport. I didn't really know who anyone was yet, other than the iconic names like Babe Ruth or Lou Gehrig. For those first few years, I had no way of knowing the hierarchy of Hall of Famers. Jimmy Fox, Mel Ott, and Rogers Hornsby were all Hall of Famers, according to the cards, but so were guys like Dave Bancroft, Ross Youngs, and Chick Hafey. Carl Hubble, Lefty Grove, and Walter Johnson were Hall of Fame pitchers, but so were guys like Jesse Haynes, Ted Lyons, and Rube Marquard. It was up to me to figure out who were the upper echelon Hall of Famers, who were the inner circle guys. Like I said, I was five years old. I wasn't quite ready for that type of analysis yet. My favorite book at the time was Go Dog Go by P.D. Eastman. I hadn't even graduated to Roald Dahl yet. But this Charles Conlon card set laid the foundation for me to learn their names, to see their statistics, to get an idea of some sort of timeline for the history of the game I was learning to love. Like lots of kids, collecting cards played a huge role in my love of sports. Now, this was before the internet, and before satellite TV allowed anyone in any city to watch any game from any sport on any night seeing the best athletes in each sport play every game, no matter where they lived. I was lucky to have been such a young age and just happened to be starting to collect cards when that sporting news set came out. So many of my friends who also liked baseball didn't care about the history of the game the way that I did, because they weren't exposed to those players the way that I was. Most of my friends or kids in the neighborhood who were 5 to 10 years older than me had already aged out of their collecting years by the time that set came out, so they never had access to a set like that to help them learn about baseball's past. And since this was before social media, it's not like they were just happening upon old videos or stories being told about the players I was learning about on these cards. But the timing was just right for me. And while I didn't know it at the time, Charles Conlon's photography shaped the course of my life. Don't forget, it's a huge help when you guys rate and review the show on whatever platform you choose to listen. Five-star ratings help our podcast get shown on more people's suggested podcast pages, which means more people will hear our show. It just takes a couple seconds of your time but it really helps us a lot. And of course, liking us on social media, interacting with our posts, and sharing things with your friends is great too. No matter how you choose to support us, even if it's just by listening, we appreciate you being here. Until next time, I'm Dan Wallach, and this is My Baseball History.